so that the live feed, feed can, can be successfully streamed. streamed. But, but Lance, Lance is still, still working, working on that, so I'll, so I'll make the introductory the announcements, announcements and, and, and uh, uh, we'll ask, ask Brother, Brother Corey Willis, Willis to lead us in an opening, opening prayer, prayer in a moment, and, and then Brother uh, uh, Sean Cavendish is going to speak, speak to us uh, on the subject, the subject of, of the kingdom, the kingdom of, God. of God. So we're, we're thankful, thankful for all, all that are here. here. We're thankful for those that have been able to uh, join, uh, join us both, both uh, locally, locally and also uh, uh, remotely, remotely uh, through, through the, the internet. internet. And, and on those on occasions, occasions when we weren't, we weren't able, able to have, have that live stream, stream uh, active, active because, because of the weather, uh, we, uh, we still, still hope to be able, able to subsequently send and, and provide online on access to the recording. So. Uh, it's been a wonderful lectureship, wonderful series of lessons. I've benefited greatly from these studies uh, in the preparation of the lecture book, but also in hearing the presentation of the material because the same, you know, what you put, you know, is, is, is your, your reasoned out thoughts, and then what you present, you know, is, is sort of the cream that rises to the top. And so uh, always it's good to have a mix of both of those. Uh, but this is an important series of lessons because it deals with one of the most fundamental themes that does exist in Scripture, and that is the church that Jesus said he would establish and did. Uh, and so we're members of that blood-bought institution uh, that uh, is the realm in which we find salvation. So to study that is well worth our time, and especially in an era when such fundamentals are often neg neglected. Uh, during the evening track, of course, we've been looking at lectures concerning Christ and the church and her Savior, the church and her Lord, and tonight Brother Jesse Flowers will speak on the church and her teacher. So that theme uh, has had a continuity to it. In, in the, the hour, hour that, that we're presently, presently at, at awake, awake and alert, alert coffee, coffee having, having done, done its work, work uh, uh, we're, we're looking, looking at the identity of God's people. Brother Sean is going to speak to us on the kingdom of God. And then as the day unfolds at 9 o'clock, David Dan will speak on the pattern of worship uh, in the local church. And then Brother Joe Price, uh, who recently, if you did not know, has moved from Washington where he was there for the century, about right, uh, and now is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, he was telling that to one of the young ladies at the back, the guys got big, and she, Las Vegas, there's saints in Las Vegas? And I said, well, there were saints in Rome. Vegas always working with congregation well, uh, leading the uh, practical track that deals with developing leadership uh, brother Sean of course uh, he born in Arkansas. has been married for 10 years has two kids uh, did his education work first at Bobby University in Missouri and then at the Harding School of Theology in Memphis and we, he and I were talking about that experience and enjoyed, you know, the, the teachers that he had there. Uh, he'd been preaching since the age of 16. He's preached in Missouri and Kansas and presently is at Wichita, Kansas. And so we're glad to have him and he's going to speak to us in just a moment. But at this point, let's bow and uh, we'll ask Brother Corey to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Our glorious Lord, our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning acknowledging you as our King and our Lord. Father, having authority in every way in our lives because we've submitted ourselves to you. May we constantly evaluate, God, how we serve you to seek to do so better. We thank you for the work of these men and women who have prepared their thoughts as they've presented their material and ultimately, God, your word to us in a way that we can understand it. We ask that you help us as we head back to our local congregations to be reminded of these things, to make sure that we are speaking of that pattern and our identity, our need to be unspotted from this world. Our God, that we might seek for unity above all, that we might unify in your truth. We thank you, God, for, Father, the times like these that we can have peace uh, to be able to have these conversations publicly and we pray that you be with those nations who are not able to to speak and worship you as publicly as we help us God to be a benefit to Christians throughout this world and to be benefited by them that we might have humility to realize that we are we are not the only ones with that gospel and at times we'll need uh, to be encouraged by those saints as well and father that we are all one in your kingdom 
especially this week, God, we're encouraged by our young people who are here and not only paying attention to these things, but taking notes about these things. And Father, they are in many ways the present of the church and the future of the church. And we pray, God, that you will help us to encourage and embolden them to serve you. And Father, regardless and whatever our stage of life might be, that there is work that we can do, uh, as was demonstrated yesterday, to provide wisdom to younger generations, to be leaders at any point in our life, that God, that in all things you might be glorified. We pray that you will especially be with Sean at this time as he presents your gospel to us. And it's all these things we pray through the name of your Son, Jesus, the Christ, our Savior, and our Lord. Amen. Please be taking out your Bibles and be turning to the book of Colossians, the first chapter. Colossians chapter 1 is where we will be beginning our study this morning. Colossians chapter 1. I am thankful for the opportunity to be with you this morning. and Thank you for those who are committed in being here at a bright and early time. And we are thankful that we have this time to be able to study God's Word. I'm thankful for the invitation to be with you and to be able to present some thoughts from the Word of God this morning. Society recognizes the need for understanding our identity. I think you can see that if you just turn on the news, if you listen to podcasts, you will understand that there is a lot of discussion about identity going on, especially in the realm of social issues like gender identity. And we can have a lot to say about that, but that's not the point of our discussion this morning. The point is that God's people do have an identity. God's people have an identity that is rooted in who God is. Any form of identifying self without understanding who God is and apart from his image is going to lead to ungodliness and sin. But God's word provides an answer into who we are as God's people. And God's people should not be confused about who they are. We should not be confused about our priorities. We should not be confused about what is important to us or what we believe. Because we are a people who have an identity, and the identity that we have that is sometimes used in Scripture is the idea of us as the kingdom of God. In Matthew's account of the gospel, in Matthew chapter 21, there is a passage there in which Jesus, he says as he is concluding a a discussion... And he says, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And what you see very clearly, I think, in association with the kingdom is the idea of a people. And in Colossians chapter 1, the apostle Paul, he begins this chapter in this epistle with a discussion about God's people and the saints as he talks about in the first uh, few verses of who they are that we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 3. He says in verse 9 that the saints are to be thankful and that they are to be growing in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, that they are to give thanks to God, in verse 12, for the salvation that we have that has been secured through Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. That what God did in saving us through Jesus Christ, he rescued us, he brought us out of the rule and the dominion of Satan, and he placed us in the kingdom of God's Son. That we have been rescued and transferred. We have been redeemed, as he goes on in verse 14. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have been bought back. We have been purchased by God. And we have been forgiven of our sins. What you see, I think, very clearly in this text is that these are all some affirmations of benefits and blessings that we have received as God's children. That we are now in this kingdom, as Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in 1 Thessalonians in the second chapter, and in verse 12, he says there, 
so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That through the gospel and the call of the gospel, and when we answer and respond to that, we are made a part of the kingdom of God. I think it's very clear that the kingdom of God is something that is established at the time of this writing, at least, that it had been established. And that it is something that Christians are a part of. That we become associated with the kingdom of God. And we see very clearly in the idea of a kingdom is that you have a king. In Colossians chapter 1, that's where the Apostle Paul goes in his discussion. He discusses a great deal about the identity of our king. As he has talked about the blessings that we receive through Christ, he then turns his attention to Christ, the king. That he is the image of the invisible God, in verse 15, the firstborn of all creation. In verse 16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. I want you to just notice and recognize the language that Paul uses there. Where he is identifying that Christ has preeminence and authority over all authority. Because he is the sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. And so we see that Jesus is God. He is the creator and he is the one to whom God has granted all authority. And then we see that he is the head in verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. There's the language of headship that I want you to notice in the companion passage in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, in Ephesians chapter 1, this is the conclusion of a prayer that Paul is writing. And he says in verse 20, talking about Christ and his majesty, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. I just want you to notice that we are talking about the exaltation of Jesus, that he is sitting at God's right hand, that God has raised him from the dead and has placed him at this position of authority and power, which he goes on in verse 21 and explains far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now what you notice here is that Jesus is the one who has been placed at the right hand of God. He is the one who has all authority and power. He is the one who has been raised from the dead. He has been exalted to the right hand of God. He is the one who has all authority and we are his subjects. We have all this language of Christ's majesty and his regal and kingly authority here. That he is head over his kingdom, the church which is his body, the fullness of him. And so we have here the Apostle Paul in Colossians in chapter 1. He is identifying not only the kingdom as God's people, as those who have been redeemed and saved, but we also have the identity of the king, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And so what you begin to recognize is that the citizens of the kingdom are the saints. Those who have been forgiven and redeemed and saved by the king. The kingdom of Christ was established and Christ was ruling the kingdom at the time of Paul's writing in the letter of Colossians and Ephesians. And you can go back and you can recognize all of that very clearly. As through the call of the gospel, we are placed in the kingdom of God to the glory of the Father. And it becomes very apparent as you read in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, that there is the expectation of the kingdom. 
The Gospels open with that heightened expectation where John the Baptist is preaching a message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus and his apostles continue to preach that same message. So much so in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9 and in verse 1, Jesus, he provides the expectation that the kingdom of God would be established within the lifetime of those to whom he was presently speaking with, who were hearing his words and his message. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And the kingdom of God came within the generation to whom Jesus was preaching and speaking. I think it's very obvious and very clear if we're honest in our study that we are not waiting for a future earthly nationalistic kingdom over which Christ is going to rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Premillennialism undermines not only the kingdom ideas, but it undermines the king and the authority of the king. The New Testament clearly teaches that when Christ comes again, it's not going to be establish his kingdom. It's going to be to overturn or turn over an already established kingdom back over to the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so what you recognize as the descriptions that are used of God's people is that the church, as an assembly or congregation, as we looked at, I believe it was on Monday night, we saw that the church in Christ is the Savior, and Christians are the saved. And you just build upon these metaphors or these descriptions of God's people, and you clearly see that the kingdom is a description of God's people. That Jesus is the king, and we are the citizens or the subjects to the king. And then you could see all uh, sorts of other descriptions that are used. The household of God, that the church is sometimes described as the vineyard of God, where Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. The body of Christ, where Jesus is the head and the Savior and we are members of the body. Or one of my favorite descriptions that sometimes we don't talk about a lot is the idea that the church is the army of God and Jesus is the captain of the army and we are the soldiers You have all these descriptions of God's people where we recognize a connection to Christ and our position and our roles and our responsibilities. Which brings us to the important question that we need to really understand. What is our responsibility as a citizen in the kingdom of God? What does life in the kingdom of God require of us? What does it really look like? That's what I want to spend the remainder of our time together looking at this morning. Is life in the kingdom of God. And what it is going to require of us. And how it might shape us in our understanding of certain things. And one of the things that I think we will consider if life in the kingdom of God as citizens of the kingdom, as subjects to Christ, it's going to reshape our understanding of grace, faith, and works. One of the most hotly debated subjects among Protestants is the subject of grace, faith, and works. You have Calvinists and even neo-Calvinists who readily accept that faith and obedience are mutually exclusive ideas. Advocates of salvation by faith alone, apart from any act of obedience, they usually will appeal to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4, I invite you to be taking your Bibles and be turning there. In Romans chapter 4, And this is something that is affecting even gospel preachers. It's something that is affecting churches. When they hear that there is only believing and trusting and there is no obedience, that we're not saved by any actions. 
And the appeal is made to Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. Where they might quote, but to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And it appears that we have a very shallow understanding of what faith really is. I've heard preachers of the gospel say, you look at Romans chapter 4 and there is nothing that Abraham does in Romans chapter 4. And I would point out at least two things that Abraham does in Romans chapter 4. That he is circumcised. In verse 11, that Paul is talking about how he received the sign of circumcision. If you go back to the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 17, you see that, that Abraham was circumcised the very same day that God told him to do so. That's obedience. That's something that Abraham did, I think, very clearly. Obviously, as you continue on in this chapter, in Romans chapter 4, Paul continues to write about Abraham's faith, and he says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. He and Sarah conceived Isaac. That he and his wife came together and conceived Isaac, the son of promise. That's something that Abraham did. There is obedience on the part of Abraham. And so whenever we start trying to tease apart the idea of faith from obedience, we're going to have a very uh, poor understanding of what faith is. And I think a very full examination of Romans 4 will show that there is plenty of obedience on Abraham's part. But I want us to think about faith and the idea of what faith is, and it is a good kingdom kind of word. The word uh, in the Greek, pistis, it means the state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed. It's faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, commitment. That word fidelity, you were in the Marine Corps, I think, semper fi, right? It is the idea of being ever faithful, that we are going to be completely loyal. That is what is demanded of us. The idea of fidelity, it means continuing loyalty to a person, cause, or belief. That is what faith is, that whenever we understand faith, that we're giving our fidelity, our faithfulness, our loyalty to the king. In the kingdom of God, that's what is absolutely required of citizens. And so if we understand faith to under include loyalty and faithfulness, then we're going to have a very robust or fuller view, not just something that's very thin and shallow, but we're going to have a very comprehensive understanding of what faith really is. That it is going to involve commitment, faithfulness, and even obedience to God. This is something that even denominational people are picking up on Matthew Bates he writes in his book salvation by allegiance alone he says furthermore if we were to determine that in appropriate salvation oriented context in the New Testament pistis most likely means faithfulness or fidelity or allegiance then might not pistis by its very definition include concrete acts that are inseparable from allegiance. In other words, we might come to discover that faith and works are not mutually exclusive after all. That when we talk about faith, and I think as Paul does, he talks about in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5, it's the obedience of faith. That whenever you come to talk about faith, you can just in hand and glove, you're talking about acts of obedience, concrete acts, as he says. And as King Jesus shows us grace and mercy by forgiving us of our sins, what he requires of us 
is to give him our heart and our loyalty, our absolute, complete self. And so whenever we give him our heart, our life, our loyalty, our allegiance, all of those being reciprocating adjectives in the way that I'm using it, that would entail faithful obedience. It's not that we are saved by faith apart from works. It is that we are saved by faithful obedience or works of faith. I think we make a mistake whenever we give in to people who accept this false dichotomy, which we heard a lot about yesterday, between faith and works or faith and obedience. When we just grant that to those who believe in salvation by faith alone and to a Calvinist, we are making a mistake. Because that's going to, if we accept that premise, logically speaking, it should lead us down the road that would lead to Calvinism. But if we want to accept the biblical picture of grace, faith, and works, model citizens of the kingdom of God, we must give our allegiance, our obedience, our faith to the king. Faith cannot be saying, I trust the king, and then not live a life of loyalty to the king. Faith must inherently involve obedience to King Jesus. And so... We need to recognize that. That faith is not just inclusive of obedience, nor is it merely the cause of obedience. True faith in its very nature is obedience to God. Remember in a discussion that Jesus had with the Jews in John the 6th chapter? In John chapter 6, in John chapter 6, and in verse 28, they came to Jesus and they said, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? In the very next verse, Jesus answered and said to them, verse 29, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Faith is an act of obedience. Faith is an act of allegiance to Christ and to God. And so when we might come to passages that are very difficult, like Romans chapter 4, and we want to say that there's nothing that you do, faith is something that you do. Faith is an act of obedience in giving our heart and loyalty to the King. That's something that if we're going to be citizens in the kingdom of God, we are demanded and commanded to give Jesus our faith, and to trust in Him completely and utterly. But a second thing that we are going to do as citizens in the kingdom of God, we are going to recognize Christ's authority and His Word as authoritative for us. In keeping with that kingdom metaphor, citizens are subject to a king's authority. As Brother Doy Moyer writes, Authority begins with one who has the right to speak and expect others to listen. It is grounded in the idea that there is someone rightfully in charge and to which others are amenable. That's, in essence, what the gospel is all about, recognizing Christ's authority. So much so that submitting to Christ's authority is an element of faith. Turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew the 8th chapter, I love this moment in Jesus' life and this encounter with Jesus. That a, a Roman centurion comes to Jesus, and he has a servant in his home who is paralyzed. And he wants Jesus to heal him. And what I find so amazing in this discussion, it says in Matthew chapter 8, we'll pick up at verse 8. It says, But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. 
And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now, here is just a wonderful explanation of what authority is, isn't it? And here is this Roman centurion, and he says, Jesus, I am in no position to be able to command something of you. You're the one who has authority to do this. That I am someone who is under authority. And I submit myself to you. That and you just say the word and it will happen. And then what's amazing is they are having this discussion about authority. Notice in verse 10, verse 10 what Jesus says. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who are following, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. And when we understand authority, when we understand about Bible authority, when we understand and recognize Christ's authority, we are talking about faith. We're talking about all the things that we just spoke about, allegiance and loyalty to the king and to his word. Something that I think throughout history, at least, in churches of Christ, what we have done very well is talk about Bible authority. I fear that may be changing with some in my own generation. But talking about obedience and biblical authority is not something to be ashamed of. It is something that is a defining characteristic of kingdom citizens. And I'm sure that this is something that we have all spoken about and we have preached and we have heard. That Bible authority is established in one of three ways. I'm not going to go through all of that and illustrate it with you. Other than whenever I hear brothers and sisters in Christ be critical of CENI, and they would say, this is just something that's man-made, it's contrived, it's something that is reverse engineering of sorts in order for us to arrive at the same conclusions. My undergraduate work was in communication and journalism. And I was attending a class at the University of Central Arkansas in Conway, Arkansas, and I had a class called Media Theory and Research I don't think I took 8 a.m. classes. I'm not used to speaking at 8 a.m. I don't like being up at 8 a.m. <laughs> uh, but I tried to avoid those classes. I think that was a 9 o'clock class, if I remember right. But I took this media theory and research class. And the professor, he was hard to listen to. He was pretty dull and boring. And then there was something that he said that, resonated with me and I still have it in my notes for that class he said that we speak and we learn and communicate in at least three different ways he didn't use this same language right here of direct statements or commands and approved examples and necessary inferences I'll tell you what he said he said we learn from reports and he defined reports as prepared statements of fact Okay. Then he said that we learn through judgments, and he described that as examples or models, charts, tests, polls, and data from other sources that are pulled together. And then he said we learn from inferences, <laughs> that we see the conclusions that come from reports and judgments and inferences. At that point, I was convinced. This isn't reverse engineering. This is how communication is engineered. This is how God communicates. This is how Jesus communicated. Whenever I hear people like John Mark Hicks or others write about we need to have a Jesus-centered hermeneutic, I'm okay with that. Insofar that we understand that Jesus used and he communicated using commands or statements and examples and inferences. 
If we're going to have a Jesus-centered hermeneutic, we need to have the same hermeneutic that Jesus had. And so whenever we understand Bible authority, we're going to recognize Jesus and how he communicated. We're going to recognize his word as approved and as authoritative. But it's not just limited to even what he said. Someone made that observation yesterday. It's not just about the red letters in our Bibles. Especially when in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 15, when Jesus was speaking to his apostles and he told them that he was going to send them out, that they were going to have the spirit of truth and that they would recall the words of Jesus and that they would testify about Jesus. And we need to know and be nourished on the words of the apostles And we need to be recognizing Jesus' heralds, the ones that Jesus sent out. We're not going to be dismissive of the book of Galatians or the book of 1st or 2nd Corinthians just because it doesn't contain the words of Jesus. We're going to recognize that. We're going to be nourished on that. We're going to be built up on those words just as much as we are in the parables and the stories and the teachings of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so when we recognize Bible authority, and we're going to have an appreciation and a respect for doing things the way that Jesus wants us to do it. We're going to worship the King in the way that He requires. We're going to organize the work of the church in a way that he wants us to be working and doing and organized. We're going to express and appreciate the mission of the king. And we're going to have a respect for the mission and the scope of the church. Because the kingdom of God, as Jesus said, is not an earthly kingdom. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. And he was talking to Pilate. It's a spiritual kingdom. And so the church has no business in involving themselves in a social gospel or promoting social justice. We're not even in the business of self-promotion through podcasts or those kinds of things. Whatever it is that we do, it should be for the glory of Christ and the kingdom and recognizing Jesus as the king. And that brings us to our final point this morning. And if we as kingdom citizens, we are expected to preach the gospel of the kingdom. If Jesus has all authority, if he rules and demonstrates his authority, he has authority over the pulpit. And I'm supposed to submit myself to Christ. What I teach, it's supposed to be in line and in harmony with the will of the king, not my will. Not what I think. Preachers cannot seek relevance and popularity over the truth. If we try to promote ourselves, then we are taking away glory from Christ. Therefore, Paul says, preach the word. That's the charge. That's the commission that we have been given. I think we also need to be recognizing churches. Churches should expect the pulpit to be a place where the gospel is proclaimed, where the truth is defended, and where error is exposed. That is what is involved in preaching the whole counsel of God. That we're going to recognize the many different facets of preaching the gospel. And when we expose error, we're going to talk about premillennialism. We're going to talk about Calvinism and how it is wrong. We're also going to see the influence of neo-Calvinism among churches of Christ. We're going to see Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism. 
and the charismatic movement. We're going to talk about institutionalism and how that is wrong. We're going to talk about denominationalism. We're going to talk about neo-spiritualism. We're going to talk about immodesty. We're going to talk about social drinking. We're going to talk about marriage and divorce. We're going to talk about adultery and fornication. If Jesus is truly king of our life and king of our pulpits, then this is going to be an expression of the will of the king. Because the pulpit should be an expression of the kingship of Jesus Christ. And whenever there are folks who would begin to try to use biblical terms unbiblically and hijack the Bible away from us, I'm not going to capitulate to those folks. When they present false dichotomies between gospel or doctrine or faith and works or grace and obedience, I'm just going to accept that readily. I'm not going to give in to the pressures to change the work of the church into a pseudo-denomination. I'm not going to give up biblical words like grace, faith, works, obedience, love. Those are the things that we must recognize when we're preaching the kingdom of God. When we're preaching the King Jesus gospel because Jesus is king and we are his subjects we are obligated to do his will and we must bring our lives under his power and his dominion therefore we should give him our heart our faith our lives our obedience, and our love. We should praise and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus, our Savior. Because when you think about who Jesus is as King, it means that we recognize His divine reign. We recognize His authority and power. When we talk about Jesus as king, we recognize that we are to surrender our life to him. That we are his subjects. When we recognize Jesus as king, we proclaim his authority. We're not ashamed of his authority. We're not ashamed of his word. And when we understand Jesus as king, it reveals our identity our obligations, what we believe, and our work and our mission. The things that we do in our life, the things that we say, the things that we do in our churches, the things that we preach, when we say those things and do those things and practice those things, what we think of the kingdom and the work becomes a reflection of the king himself. Thank you for your good attention this morning. It's been my pleasure in the last several years to get to know Sean and to spend time with him. Uh, he is a man of deep conviction, of, of considerable ability, and he's committed to the ancient paths, and this lesson that we've heard reflects that quite clearly. So thank you very much. I would encourage us to use the next few minutes. We'll need to reconvene back here at the top of the hour, but you have a few minutes to uh, move about. And while we're here this morning, give a special word of thanks to the CEI staff who worked so hard during this week. Uh, normally, they put in full hours at the bookstore. This week, they're doing double duty, and they're doing it with a smile on their face. But thank them for the wonderful service they're providing to us. Appreciate it. Let's be dismissed.
It's about time for us to begin. If you could make your way with your seat. To mention, uh, yesterday we announced that a ring had been found and it's been turned in. If you lost a ring uh, or if you know someone that was here yesterday that did and you can get in touch with them, to the ladies at the registration desk. We've been talking all week. Uh, to and actually expressed an interest in. Uh, and the pattern for worship. And so this is something dear. Uh, six children. Magazine, I'll talk. To Brother David Dan. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> if you'd like to have John chapter 4 in front of you, we'll look at that passage as we begin in just a moment. I do appreciate the opportunity to speak on this subject and to be here and to be with you. I appreciate uh, the invitation to speak on this subject. And as Kyle mentioned, by invitation, I mean that I invited myself to speak on this subject. It's the best kind of invitation, I guess. But we've had in this 9 o'clock track a study of the pattern, and my good friends and brothers Jeff Wilson and Danny Linden have done an excellent job the past two mornings as Jeff talked about the fact that there is a pattern, that God is a God of patterns, and took a very comprehensive look at Scripture and proving that point, that God has always had a pattern for mankind and has been a he's done and then yesterday morning more specifically Danny drilled down into the pattern the New Testament pattern the pattern for the worship to begin in thinking about these things by looking at what Jesus said in John chapter 4 in his discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4 and verse 23, Jesus said, But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. We need to be impressed by the fact that God wants his people to worship him. As the Lord said, he is seeking, he is seeking these true worshipers to worship him. And so as we begin to think about worship, we need to understand that worship matters. It matters because God wants to receive the worship of his people. And, of course, the local church is made up of God's people under the new covenant. You have a group of people who have banded together for the purpose of working for the Lord and serving the Lord. Those who have been baptized into Christ, who have now come together for this purpose. As Paul describes it in Acts 20 and verse 28, the church, the local church, is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. A people purchased by the blood of the Lord. And so being composed of these called out in a particular area 
The local church is active, it's functioning, it's a spiritual body of believers designed to glorify God, and so it assembles to collectively offer worship to God, and we see this, of course, throughout the New Testament. We read about the church coming together, especially in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, but we have various other passages that indicate that as well. In James chapter 2, in that section that deals with not showing partiality, that's in the context of the church assembling. As James talks about there in James 2 and verse 2, there's a man that comes into your assembly. And so the church is gathered, it's assembled for worship, and here is this visitor who comes in, and we have to determine to treat each one properly. And then, of course, Hebrews 10 and verse 25 tells us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There's an assembling together that takes place in the local church, and that assembling, of course, involves worship. There has always been a right way and a wrong way to God. And the New Testament clearly instructs the local church to come together and to offer proper and true worship to God. That's what he desires. And so there is a pattern for the worship of the local church that the Lord has given so that it might glorify God. So as we look at this, this morning for a few minutes, what I'd like for us to do in looking at the concept of a pattern for worship is to really attack this by answering seven questions, seven questions that we want to work through as we examine this subject matter. The first question that we want to deal with is, what is worship? How is worship defined? You know, we see this term in the New Testament, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I've got the New King James Version on the screen here, but notice in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 25, we read about one who will worship God. And that term worship there means to make obeisance, do reverence to. It's an act of homage or reverence that is offered according to Vine. And so we have this concept of offering an expression of reverence. Now there are other verbs that the New Testament employs that also are translated worship or something like that throughout the New Testament. But the basic idea that we find is that worship is the offering of the religious expression of praise, of of adoration, of reverence, of love, thankfulness, devotion. That's what worship is is and God has always directed man to worship him. We go all the way back to the beginning of history. In Genesis 4, we read about Cain and Abel coming to offer their worship before God. And the divine commentary, of course, in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 says by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. There was worship being offered to God. One man did it correctly and the other did not. And worship to God, we need to understand, is worship that is offered to a holy God who cares about how he is worshipped. When you look at the Ten Commandments given at Sinai, right from the very start, what do those commandments deal with? Worship being offered properly, not making graven images, not worshipping other gods, worshipping God as he wants to be worshipped. We read about the sons of Aaron in Leviticus chapter 10 and how they failed to offer proper worship according to God's will. And they were consumed by the fire of the Lord as a result of that. There's always been a right way to worship God. There have been many wrong ways that man has devised to worship God. And when we look through the New Testament, we find that there is worship that is based on the doctrines of men, Matthew chapter 15. There is ignorant worship, which Paul addressed in Acts chapter 17. There is idol worship, of which we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There is self-imposed or will worship that is according to the will of man in Colossians chapter 2. There are all these wrong ways to worship. 
but God's people under the new covenant are responsible for offering proper worship. 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, as we think about this concept of worship, let's also think about this question. Is all of life worship? Now, there are those that insist that worship is just a lifestyle. That if you're a child of God, this is your lifestyle. This is the way you live. It's all worship. John Mark Hicks has been quoted from a number of times the past couple of days. And here in the book, A Gathered People, it's not just Hicks, but his co-authors, Johnny Melton and Bobby Valentine, who've authored this, where I want to say co-conspirators, but we'll just say co-authors. And in this book, they say, our lives become worship through spiritual service. Serving meals to the homeless is just as much worship as serving the Lord's Supper. Now, taken to its conclusion, from this perspective, you're worshiping God while you're mowing the lawn, while you're watching television, just as much as when you are partaking of the Lord's Supper, because everything you do in your life as a Christian is worship. But, remember this, worship, according to Scripture, is a verb. It is a verb. It is an action. To worship is to engage in a deliberate and specific action at a specific time and place as an expression of reverence and praise to God. You remember that the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, in verses 27 and 28, what does it say? He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning. In Acts chapter 24, what did Paul say that he did? In Acts 24 and verse 11, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. Everything isn't worship. Worship is an action that is deliberately engaged in by God's people. And so while we all should have a lifestyle that reflects our devotion toward God... And we should all be constantly serving God to worship God. Again, is to engage in the deliberate offering up of spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. All of life is not worship. Now, having an understanding of what worship is, we turn to our second question. Is there a pattern for worship? Is there a pattern for worship? You know, many claim that the scriptures don't prescribe a pattern for the worship of the church. As we again turn to the book of Gathered People, Hicks, Melton, and Valentine, say Christian assembly appears in the narratives of Luke, Acts, and in the epistles of Paul as a habitual practice without the appearance of formal prescriptions. What do you think? Do you think we can find any formal prescriptions for worship in the New Testament? Is that a true statement or not? Well, that speaks to the question, doesn't it? Is there a pattern established by the Lord and his apostles or not? And if there's not, then we may worship however we please, focus solely on our own preferences without any concern for divine instruction. If there are no formal prescriptions for what is to be done in our worship. But what does the New Testament say? When we look through the New Testament scriptures, do we find this concept of a pattern and formal prescriptions? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you as my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. 
What happens when you teach the same thing everywhere in every church? A pattern develops, doesn't it? And we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 17, where Paul talks about what he is teaching and how he ordains it in all the churches. You, you ordain the same thing in all the churches? What happens? Well, that results in all the churches following the same set of instruction, following the pattern. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 indicates this as well in verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, Paul says, as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. See, these other churches were given this instruction. Now you're being given the same instruction. We have Philippians chapter 3 in verses 16 and 17. Paul says, nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind, brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern, the New King James Version says. That word form, the idea of a model to follow, that's what's been given. And in Philippians 4 and verse 9, he says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. A pattern of instruction has been laid out by word and by example. And if followed, you can be assured that God will be with you. And so Paul says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Yes, there is a definite pattern of instruction to which each local church must adhere in its practices to remain in fellowship with God. And as we look at the statements of truth, as we look at the commands, the approved apostolic examples, the necessary inferences that are drawn from what is said in the New Testament record, all of that communicates to us the pattern that we are to follow if we want to have fellowship with the God of heaven. We understand this concept. It's not a difficult concept. When we first got married, Cynthia and I, before we had kids, she took a sewing class, was learning to sew, and she came home one afternoon and she had a couple of packets in her hand and she was so excited, she said, look at this, look what I've got. And I said, what is it? And she said, I've got two patterns, I'm going to make some dresses. And I said, honey, that's great. You're supposed to rejoice with the wife of your youth, Ecclesiastes says, right? And sure enough, she followed those patterns, and she made a couple of dresses out of those patterns, and it came out just as planned. She said, Good job, honey. The conductor of the orchestra, what does he do? Does he just get up there and tell everybody start blowing and start playing? No, he follows what the composer laid out, those sheets of music. There's a pattern that is followed so that the product is what is desired, right? The architect draws up the blueprints. The builder doesn't just get out and start swinging the hammer so that the building is built according to those blueprints. He follows the pattern. In the play or the movie, people don't just start rambling on about whatever they want. There's a script, and the director insists that everyone follow the script so that what is produced is what was intended. The coach... Right? He doesn't tell the quarterback to just go out there and do whatever you feel like. There's a playbook. There are plays that I've drawn up. We've practiced. Everybody is supposed to be going in the direction that we have planned. And so the coach sends in the play to the quarterback, and he tells the rest of the offense, here's what we're going to do. Everybody do your job. They're following the pattern. And isn't it amazing we can see that, we get that, we understand it and grasp it in all of those areas of life. And somehow, when it comes to the very 
important aspect of worshiping God, the most critical thing in our lives, the most profound relationship we have, all of a sudden, it's a free-for-all. You don't need a pattern. You can just wing it when your soul's salvation is on the line. And you wouldn't do that in any other area of life. See, worshipers have often disregarded the pattern. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, Paul warned, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. They would get away from the pattern, Paul says. And of course, that is exactly what happened following the era of the apostles. And you have the rise of Catholicism with all of the unauthorized practices and observances of holy feast days and a separate priesthood and the worship of Mary and the use of candles and incense and holy water and the mystical corruption of the Lord's Supper and eventually instrumental music. And of course, the Protestant Reformation comes along. The Protestant denominations maybe get rid of some of those false worship practices but retain some and add some of their own. And you have, of course, the popularity of instrumental music among Protestant denominations being almost a standard practice over the past couple of centuries. You have the modern megachurches that have rejected the concept of an authoritative scriptural pattern almost altogether to the point where you have rock concerts and professionally produced dramatic theatrical productions and shows being put on constantly. And all that's supposed to be part of worship. And among those churches of Christ, which long ago abandoned the appeal to book, chapter, and verse for all that is practiced regarding the organization and work of the church, it's no surprise to see many of them adopting the worship trends of the denominations. The international churches of Christ and, and what became then from there the international Christian church in some respect, that Boston movement that was headed by Kip McKean starting in the 80s and then developed into the International Church of Christ and then and Kip got ousted around 2003, and then he formed the International Christian Church. What was the approach with all of that? Well, the, the City of Angels International Christian Church website sums it up. Be silent where the Bible speaks, and speak where the Bible is silent. Does that look backward to you? That's a stated approach. Where the Bible does not prohibit a practice or name, we're free to use our God-given creativity. We're free to practice or name something as long as it does not contradict Scripture. Disregard for God's authority. Disregard for the pattern. Many worshipers continue to ignore the divine pattern for the worship of the local church, and yet the pattern remains. Now then, what are the key principles of local church worship? Well, first and foremost, we understand it must be offered in spirit and truth, right? That's what we read in John chapter, there we go, John chapter 4, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Worship must come from a heart of devotion to the Lord, offered in sincerity, but also in truth. Also, it must conform to the standard delivered by the Lord. It must be in harmony with the Word of God, in spirit and truth. Both of those aspects must be present in order for worship to be true worship, in order for it to be acceptable to God. And we find, as we think about what worship involves, that there is an assembly. Worship must involve a collective assembly of the church. Now, we understand that Christians, and we see this in the New Testament, 
Christians may at various times throughout the week pray and sing spiritual songs and study God's word, and that should be done all throughout the week. There is also an assembly of the local church. And when we see what is involved in the assembly of the church, we find that there is collective worship that is offered. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, speaking of Paul and Barnabas. When Barnabas had found Paul, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. There's an assembly that happens regularly. And each local church has to regularly assemble to worship God. Worship takes place in the first day of the week. Again, aside from the private worship in which we engage throughout the week, there is a collective assembly that happens on the first day of the week, the day upon which our Lord arose from the grave. And so we see in Acts 20 and verse 7, is now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There's a first day of the week assembly. We see the same thing with regard to the collection that is taken in 1 Corinthians 16, designated as taking place in the first day of the week. Worship also must be offered in an orderly manner to be acceptable to God. Writing in the context of the worship assembly of the local church, the Apostle Paul warned the church in Corinth concerning the danger of a disorderly worship assembly. There's a lot that's said about the worship assembly in 1 Corinthians 14. Again, if you're looking for some of those formal prescriptions, right? There they are. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Verse 40, Let all things be done decently and in order. And of course, part of the reason for that is that another key principle of worship is that it must be edifying. Edifying. It must be spiritually strengthening. It must build up the worshipers. Paul reminded the church in Corinth that even in an era in which there were miraculous spiritual gifts in operation among the members, that all of those things must be exercised, all the worship that is offered must be done in a way that is edifying for the worshipers. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, Each of you has a psalm, as a teaching, as a tongue, as a revelation, as an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. That's the way worship needs to be. It needs to be done so that everyone present is edified, built up, strengthened in the faith. And another key principle about worship in the local church is that it must be led by the male members of the church. Now, the worship assembly includes, is intended to include, and involve a mixed group of both male and female worshipers. But it is the male worshipers who are tasked with the role of leading in worship, leading in these spiritual matters. As 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12 would indicate, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach her to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And then more specifically, with regard to the collective worship of the church, again going to 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. The worship assembly of the local church must be led by the male members of the church. Acceptable worship includes all of these key principles that we see in the pattern that is revealed in Scripture. Now, with that in mind, let's look at a fourth question here. All right, so what are we to do in worship? What is the pattern for the worship that is to be offered to God when the church assembles on the first day of the week? Well, we have the Lord's Supper, don't we? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Each local church is to assemble for the purpose of remembering the sacrificial death of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, as Paul lays out the proper manner in which to observe 
the Lord's Supper. He says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so as the church assembles on the first day of the week, there is this opportunity, this privilege of being able to observe a memorial of what Christ has done for us. Laying down his life so that we can have life eternal. There is giving that is prescribed for the worship of the local church. 1 Corinthians 16, as we noticed earlier, there's a collection that is mandated for the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. And when it comes to this collection, we understand that the collection is to be taken from cheerful givers, 2 Corinthians 9 tells us. And so there is instruction here to give on the first day of the week a weekly collection. The method for raising the funds is that the members contribute. That's the pattern for the worship of the church. Free will giving of the members. Singing, as you know, is part of the pattern. There is musical worship of each local church. People say, well, you, you don't believe in, worship, in, in music, in worship. Do you believe in music and worship? We better, right? Because here's the music. Now, it's not instrumental, it's vocal. The Colossians 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There's the musical worship that is prescribed for the worship of the local church. And so that's the pattern that we see in Scripture. There's also teaching and preaching that is part of this pattern of worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as we read earlier, where Paul says in verse 26 that all things are to be done for edification, notice the context of that. He says, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. And a lot of these things that he's talking about here, these miraculous gifts here, the, the revelations, the tongues, the interpretations, what does all of that have to do with? Well, as he says here, teaching. Now, they were getting their teaching by miraculous means before the New Testament was fully revealed in written form at that time. But that's teaching that's taking place in the assembly of the church as it's gathered together. And then, of course, we have praying as part of the worship the church is to offer. Prayers unto God. And Paul connects the public prayer with the worship assembly of the local church in his discussion, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, of the proper use of miraculous gifts. But notice the principle here that, that you've got those that are praying those that are leading the assembly in prayer. Those that are leading the assembly in song. And notice here, he says at the end of that verse, I will sing with the Spirit, I'll sing with the understanding. Prior to that, he said, I'll pray with the Spirit, I'll pray with the understanding. The idea is that here is one who is leading, and everyone needs to understand what is being said, what's being offered, so that all the worshipers can join in with the worship that's being offered. And so the New Testament pattern for the worship of the church involves all of these things as the church collectively comes together to offer its worship. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned the excellent job that the others have done, and um, especially at Brother Jeff Wilson, uh, my old FC classmate and buddy and college nemesis, I expected him to cover in his pattern lesson a lot more of those passages on the pattern so that I'd have more time to do my thing, but he didn't do that, and so I'm pressed for time now. I, I'm not mad. I'm, I'm not upset with you. Right? It's fine. It's perfectly fine. Right? What is not included in the pattern? So now we've seen what is there. What's not there? Well, instrumental music in the worship of the church is not there. The use of instrumental music in worship was prescribed by God 
for Israel under the Old Covenant. Don't miss that point. I have brethren who are drifting sometimes say to me, "Uh, you know, God didn't command it in the Old Testament, and they started doing it, and the idea is, well, they just, somewhere along the line, they just started playing harps and worship, and God was okay with it. And now if we do the same thing, God will be okay with it. That's false. 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 25, for example, tells us how the use of those instruments of worship at the temple was the command of the Lord by his prophets. God commanded, he prescribed, that was part of the pattern of what he instructed Israel to do when they used those instruments of music in worship. They didn't come up with it on their own. But you know, the Old Covenant, according to Hebrews 8 and verse 13, is obsolete. It's been replaced by a new covenant. So the pattern for worship under the Old Covenant is not the same as the pattern for worship under the New Covenant. But the popularity of instrumental music and worship has dramatically increased over the past century and a half or so. And that has happened even though it is widely acknowledged that it was not present in the worship of the church in the first century. Of course, lost in all of this is, as we'll notice, what has God prescribed? What has God prescribed? The only music that is prescribed for the worship of the church is singing. The only strings that are to be plucked are the heart strings, as Paul indicates in Ephesians 5 and verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The use of instrumental music is an unapproved, unauthorized addition to the worship of the local church. you got unscriptural fundraising methods. As we've noticed, the divine pattern has to do with giving as one purposes in his heart, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. It's a collection that is taken on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, as each one has prospered. But you know, tithing is popular, right? It was prescribed in the Old Covenant. And again, people want to go back to the Old Covenant for their pattern for worship, or at least some things in the Old Covenant, right? We don't want to bring goats and lambs into the auditorium and start slaughtering them. That's messy. But we like instrumental music, and we sure like to get that tenth of everyone's income. Not just once a year, like they did it in the Old Testament, but every week we want to get that 10%. And not only that, but you have, in addition to this, many religious groups involving themselves in other fundraising methods, whether it's sales or business activities or raffles or bingo or investments or whatever it may be. All of this, whether we're borrowing from the obsolete pattern of the Old Testament or whether we're coming up with something new that's never been done before, all of that is in addition to the pattern for the worship of the church we see in the New Testament. What about performances and entertainment? It's very common to see that among religious groups today. Entertaining performances, concerts, theatrical productions, Easter egg hunts, dramatic arts. Well, I wonder if there was anything like that back in the days of the apostles. Maybe that entertainment kind of thing just hadn't been invented yet. There were plays, there were performances, the theater was active, right? But not in the worship of the local church, never in the worship of the local church. The worship prescribed in the New Testament involves a mutual, as we saw in Colossians 3 and verse 16 earlier, a mutual teaching and admonishing of one another. That's what's to go on during worship. And in contrast to that, what we see today is worshipers, so-called worshipers, attending to observe a grand performance that's put on by professionals. They're spectators. They're not worshipers. They are spectators. And worship is no longer focused on what appeals to God. It's instead geared toward whatever the worshipers desire, whatever will draw people in, draw a crowd. And of course, what's lost here is that man becomes his own God when he worships according to his own preferences. 
not about what God wants. It's about what we want, what we like. And then, of course, you have the chaos and confusion that are part of the worship of the modern charismatic movement, the Pentecostal groups, where the worship assembly gradually devolves into a chaotic frenzy where people are dancing and running up and down the aisles and maybe even rolling on the floor, clapping their hands, shouting over one another in these frantic outbursts of unintelligible gibberish as they claim to speak in tongues. But we read already in 1 Corinthians 14, that's not acceptable. None of that is acceptable. Not even when they had real miraculous gifts was that acceptable. God's not the author of confusion. Everything must be done in decency and in order. And then you have testifying, right? This idea of offering a testimonial in worship. To testify, the English word, of course, means to bear witness to, to affirm as fact or truth, attest. Similarly, the word that is translated testify in English versions of the New Testament means to be a witness, to bear witness. So you have people that will get up and worship and say, I'm, I just have to testify. And what follows is an emotional, personal story about what that person believes God has done in his or her life, interacting in some direct way at some point. Looking again at the writings of John Mark Hicks in his book, Come to the Table, as he talks about the Lord's Supper. He says, at the corporate level, the leadership could encourage testimonies in the midst of the supper. One or more could share their personal stories of grace and reconciliation as the supper is distributed or prior to its distribution. The problem with that is subjective, emotionally based, unauthoritative accounts of modern individuals do not constitute sound doctrine. Somebody says, well, the apostles, they testify. That's exactly right. They did, didn't they? In Acts 10 and verse 42, what did Peter say about that? Speaking of Jesus, Peter says, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is He who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Yes, the apostles, they certainly did testify. But when the apostles testified, they were doing what they were commanded by the Lord to do because they could bear witness. They were eyewitnesses of what they had seen with Jesus. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 1 says, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. It's not personal testimony. It's the testimony of God. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's the testimony offered by the apostles. The problem is that no living person today can testify in the way that the apostles testified because we weren't there. We didn't bear witness. We didn't see what they saw. Also, you have the popularity there we go. Now of the Lord's Supper being incorporated into a common social meal. Some are just determined to turn the Lord's Supper into something like Thanksgiving dinner. Served to satisfy the physical hunger of the worshipers. Regard Smith in his book Radical, Radical Restoration, without a shred of scriptural evidence says, perhaps the most universally overlooked feature of the Lord's Supper as practiced in the primitive church is that from all appearances, it was observed in conjunction with a fellowship meal. And when he says from all appearances, he's not talking about anything that appears in the Bible. He's talking about what appears in the, in the imagination of man. This is a normal, ordinary meal, he says, with the usual variety of food. However, unlike ordinary meals, this combined table fellowship and memorial was shared among the disciples for the special purpose of strengthening not just their physical bodies, but their common bond in the spiritual body of Christ. Hicks in Come to the Table says, In Corinth, Paul expected the supper to feed the hungry. As a table, it fed the hungry and shared with the poor. He says, Too often the church has spiritualized the Lord's Supper. 
to the extent that it has no social or economic function, the contemporary church has given the supper a mere spiritual function. How terrible, how terrible that we should focus on the spiritual function of the Lord's Supper rather than its supposed social or economic functions. And Hicks also goes into a lengthy description of how he thinks it ought to be observed in connection with a common meal, a list of items he presents that should be observed in this. And number nine on the list is serve dessert and spend the last moments of the meal talking about the experience of the supper as a meal. Now, I know he misspelled dessert there. That is the least of the issues here, okay? Ron likes Blue Bell ice cream, right? Well, there you go. Serve dessert with the Lord's Supper. What is happening here? And brethren are reading these things and thinking they've discovered something here, some insight, something important that we've overlooked. And what's ignored in all of this, of course, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, is that the Lord's Supper is not a table of shared food, as Hicks says, but it is what? It is something that involves two items. Eat this bread and drink this cup. This is all we ever see in connection with the Lord's Supper, the spiritual observance and remembrance of the death of Jesus Christ. You see dessert there? Where's dessert? Can't find it. Now, of course, the church in Corinth did attempt to do something similar to what Hicks and Smith and others have advised, and they were rebuked for it. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, Paul says, What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. And in fact, at the very end of that chapter, in that section, in verse 34, he says, But if anyone is hungry, there's your social and economic function, right? If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I'll set in order when I come. Any attempt to observe the Lord's Supper in connection with a common meal is a departure, an unauthorized addition to what is prescribed for worship in the New Testament. What about female leadership in worship? Female leadership in worship is something that has become more popular. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 and verse 28 tells us whether we're male or female. We're of equal value before God in our spiritual standing, but men and women are assigned different roles when it comes to spiritual leadership, and it's the male members who are tasked with leading in worship, as we've seen already this morning, but some are not willing to withstand the influences of culture and denominationalism in this regard. Hicks and come to the table says some are excluded from serving the table because of their gender. A set of mutual servants, a hierarchical table arrangement is interposed between male and female. At any other table, women are expected to serve. But at the table of the Lord, they are barred from serving. The exclusion of women from serving the table is rooted in an altar mentality where authority is linked to the altar. It's rooted in an inappropriate formalism that turns the assembly of the saints into an institutional hierarchy rather than a domestic family table. Well, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34 still says what it says. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive, as the law also says. And the silence here is not absolute, but this context has to do with addressing the assembly. The speakers who will get up and address the assembly. They're not to be women. So any attempt to have women leading is a departure from the pattern. All right, question number six. Where does this all lead? Where does leaving the pattern lead? Well, it leads to modern Phariseeism. Now, I know that people like you and me will be chastised as being legalistic patternists for pointing all this out. And we're just modern Pharisees. 
Well, no. You know, the idea is that this New Testament pattern is too restrictive, and, and Legard Smith is very blatant about this. Before real progress can be made, he says, we'll have to, go and I have to undergo a pivotal paradigm shift in the way we perceive even the notion of church itself. I think it, what's that saying? Well, we've got to change the pattern. We've got to change the pattern. And Hicks, Melton, and Valentine say Paul's critique of the Corinthian assemblies is rooted in the gospel. His letters do not provide a set of legally specified timeless rules for conducting an assembly. Again, the master of the false dichotomy. We've heard that terminology so much the past couple of days. The false dichotomy, the false dilemma, it's either this or this, right? Either you can have the gospel or you can have rules. Is that an either or proposition? And when I say master of the false dichotomy, I mean that as a compliment in the same way that Genesis 3 and verse 1 compliments the serpent for being more cunning or crafty than any beast of the field. What do we find in response to these things? 1 Corinthians 14 and verses 37 and 38, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord, Paul says. See some formal prescription there? See some timeless instruction there? The commandments of the Lord. That's the, that's the chapter, by the way, that we've been looking at that deals with the assembly, the worship assembly of the local church. Who are the real Pharisees here? Did Jesus ever condemn the Pharisees for strictly adhering to his instruction? Or what God's word prescribed? Never, right? What was the problem with the Pharisees? They added to God's word, and they took away from God's word as it suited them. First Corinthians, or Matthew chapter 15 and verse 3, he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. That's what the Pharisees did. They added what they wanted and imposed it on everybody. And then when they didn't really want to do what God said in his word, they just disregarded that. That's, that's the Pharisee approach. And that results, of course, in vain worship, as he mentioned in Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9. You're worshiping according to the doctrines and commandments of men. That's vain worship. That's where all of this leads. And it leads, ultimately, to divine rejection. Matthew 7. 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And you know the outcome of that scenario where the Lord says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's where this leads, when we reject the prescribed order that God has given us. All right, just about out of time. Let me just quickly offer three, three takeaways here. Let's end on a high note. What are the blessings of worshiping according to the pattern? See, it's, a, it's normally all about, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well, you guys can't have instruments and music and worship. Wow, look how boring your worship is compared to what we're doing over here. Right? Let's think about the blessings of following the pattern in the worship that we offer to God. How about the assurance of acceptance? Is that important to anyone? John in 2 John in verse 9 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Does it matter whether we have a relationship with God or do we just want to worship? To adhere to the Lord's teaching is to ensure that all is well in our relationship with God. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what this is all about? Why are we worshiping in the first place? What's the point? If it's not to ensure that our worship is accepted by the God of heaven. As Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's a wonderful blessing that God has not left each one of us to guess whether or not he will accept our worship. He has told us what is acceptable. We can be assured that if we offer what he prescribes, he will accept us. Another blessing of worshiping according to the pattern is that we have confidence in communion. 
That term communion or fellowship, koinonia, that we see so often in the New Testament, that sharing and joint participation in spiritual things as, as, it's, as it's used in connection with the church in the New Testament. Every aspect of our worship and the pattern that is given involves this joint participation with God and with one another as we worship him. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. The only way to be confident as we seek to commune with the Lord is to approach him on his terms, according to his instruction. John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you see the fellowship? Do you see the communion there for those who follow God's word? And then there's the glorification of God that comes with worshiping according to the pattern. 1 Peter 4:11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Man glorifies himself when he comes up with his own way to worship according to his own preferences. The only time God is glorified is when we're speaking as the oracles of God following God's instruction. That's when God is glorified. That's how we can, with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Paul puts it in Romans 15 and verse 6. Let me tell you something. It's a wonderful blessing to be able to honor the Lord by standing united on the solid ground of his truth as we join together with those of like precious faith and offering our praise and devotion to him in the way that he prescribes. When we worship in harmony with the pattern, we glorify the God who is worthy of our worship. It's a blessing to be able to do that. God wants his people to come together and worship him according to his instruction. What a privilege it is to participate with the Lord and with fellow believers in offering him exactly what he wants. May we always take our direction from the God of heaven and hold fast the pattern of sound words. Listen, don't ever, don't ever apologize for having enough faith to offer unto God exactly what what he tells you to offer him. Don't ever apologize for that. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Thank you for your attention this morning. Throughout the week, we have talked a great deal about unity. And as we think about that, is, is it really even possible well, I think as we've seen this morning, when we are willing to do simply what we can find in the New Testament, all believers could be one. And we thank you so much, David, for that great lesson on uh, the pattern that we see for worship. I had no idea, though, that when we scheduled in this track, we scheduled you and your nemesis. I didn't realize that, but... Uh, if you have uh, enjoyed this study, let me commend to you some work that David has done. Uh, he has a five-part series called The Overview of the Bible that's available in the foyer. He also has written a book on the church that's in the Truth for Teens series, and I would commend that to you as well. Just a couple of things that we'll mention, and we'll take just a few minutes uh, break. Don't have a lot of time, but... Um, one thing, let me remind you that there will be a children's class in the 11 o'clock track in the library. Uh, that will be during the split track. Also, if you haven't signed up in the back for the giveaway, uh, please take a moment right now to do that if you need to. We'll take a few moments. <laughs> 
I hate to interrupt the visiting, and we didn't have very much time uh, between these two sessions, but let's go ahead and return to our seats so that we can give Brother Joe Price as much time as he can have available. Brother Joe Price comes from Delta County. Texas is one of the fastest growing states in the Union, I guess compared to Florida, probably number two, but Delta County is not it. Delta County is a little bitty county stuck up in northeast Texas, population 5,000, and it's been that way for decades upon decades. Uh, but that small county uh, is got, it's actually been a, a place of significance because there was a couple that moved there. Uh, Bob Lacoste went there to labor with the Cooper Church and his wife Carolyn uh, during the 1970s, I suppose it was, uh, was high school teacher and among her students were Joe and Jim Price. And while they formerly had been devout Methodist, they learned the truth of the gospel through the work of, of Bob and Carolyn Lacoste and obeyed the gospel. And Jim, faithful member of the Cooper Church to this day, and he and his wife are active members there, and Joe and Debbie, uh, they've traveled far beyond the, uh, their homes and have labored in a variety of different places. You can see the details uh, of where Joe has worked, but he is currently in Nevada, uh, laboring with the Lord's Church in Las Vegas, and has traveled repeatedly to India to spread the gospel to foreign lands. I would, would remind you, the book references where his sword tips, which is a daily column can be, it's a daily paragraph of spiritual thoughts can be found, and we're working with Joe to put that together into a, a printed product, and so that will be of value for short, uh, thoughtful reflections upon God's Word that people can use on a daily basis. But we're looking forward to hearing brother Joe as he addresses his subject and thinks in terms of the, the dangers that come to the Lord's church as we would potentially digress from that pattern and what can happen when we do digress into denominational thinking. So brother Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here and I too also appreciate the invitation and this opportunity as we turn our attention to God's word. Let me I encourage you to uh, begin by looking at uh, Acts chapter 20, 29 and 30, where uh, we are reminded that there are forces of error that attack local churches both from without and from within. Uh, in Acts the 20th chapter, the Apostle Paul, in speaking with the elders of the church in Ephesus, said, I know this. So this was not some uh, possibility, uh, perhaps it will occur. He's, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. So we have both uh, from outside, uh, from without the congregation, and also from within the congregation, the dangers uh, that attack God's people. In, and therefore, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, there is an apostolic warning, a stern warning, within a context of preaching the word that reflects our time. When it says, both for the listeners and for the preachers, there's a warning. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, uh, and they will draw or uh, turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And so this warning not only reflected a time that the apostle was uh, warning Timothy of, but it reflects the occasion of this present hour as listeners become more uh, uh, more interested in having their ears scratched, listening, hearing what they want to hear, and also uh, proclaimers of God's word that become people pleasers and ear scratchers rather than proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in preaching the word, we must be watchful in all things, and we'll come back to that thought uh, later in our study this morning. So let's, let's turn our attention to, as 
uh, as uh, we've been given this title, denominational and dealing with denominational influences among the in the church, among churches of Christ. Brethren, first of all, we have to admit that these influences exist. In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, when uh, the shepherd David came to uh, the battlefield and saw God, uh, Goliath defying the armies of the living God, and he is asking about uh, what is going to be uh, uh, given to, what's going to be the outcome of the one who, who uh, uh, deals with this defier. And Eliab, his older brother, scolded him, was, was angry at him. Uh, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. And yet David said, in essence, what have I done? Is there not a cause? Brethren, there is a cause. There is a cause of truth and righteousness. There is a cause of the word and will of God in the hearts and lives of his people in, in this world. And we have to be uh, of the perception to recognize that there is a cause. That, uh, that when denominational influences, when de influences of error infiltrate and affect the hearts, minds, and lives of Christians, then churches are affected. And that's what we want to explore today in, these series of, in this series of lessons is, is in admitting that these influences exist, how do they develop? Well, these, these influences begin to develop and exist when we fail to grow in a knowledge of the Word of God and the spiritual discernment that must come along with that. In Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11, the apostle said, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. Now see the linkage between the growth and abounding love that is shaped and molded by knowledge and all discernment. Love without knowledge becomes self-defined and without the discernment to properly apply the knowledge, then the love will be misdirected. He says, Do, I, I pray this for you, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. He says in this growth of knowing God's word and having the spiritual perception of application of God's word, we can make decisions. We choose and approve the things that are excellent. Necessarily, then, we avoid those things that are not excellent before God. Brethren, if we fail to grow through a use of the word of God, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 expands that thought. If we fail through the use of the word of righteousness to grow, then we are susceptible to the forces of error that swirl around in the religious world and in our secular society, and we will be consumed by them. We will be blown away from uh, the truth of the gospel into the uh, errors that men develop and uh, demonstrate in their lives and proclaim around us and are seen in the denominational churches of men. Secondly, these denominational influences grow and develop and exist when we lose sight that God's word includes contending for the faith. We, I remember early in, in hearing of, of the militancy of the gospel, of the aggressiveness of pro proclaiming truth and addressing errors that exist uh, around us in the religious communities, as well as addressing those things among us that uh, distort and, uh, and bring defect uh, to the word of God and the souls of his people. Don't hear so much about fighting the good fight of faith these days. We need to re, uh, reinvigorate ourselves into to that recognition. In Jude, verses 3 and 4, we, Paul, Jude says, I was very diligent, beloved, to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That is to agonize intensely concerning the faith, the gospel, that which was once for all delivered. Now, why do that? 
for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Without a doubt, the doctrines of the denominations turn God's grace into unrestrained conduct, into lewdness. It denies the very Lord and that which he has accomplished for us and that which he proclaims to us to do to come to him and to live in him. We must regain our focus that contending for the faith is not being belligerent. It's not being hateful. It's not uh, mistreating people. It is keeping a focus upon the, the faith, the truth, and the outcome of salvation rather than the loss of souls. Denominational influences, brethren and friends, exist, develop, and exist when God's truth is not preached and received as absolute. There's already been some things said about that through these lectures, and I appreciate that. Let me, uh, in addition to that, turn our attention to John 4, uh, 18 for a moment. As Jesus is before Pilate, you remember that Pilate said, Are you a king then? As he's been discussing that with Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, You have said rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Unfortunately, you see, that has become the postmodern concept. What is truth? Truth is relative. My truth, your truth, another's truth. But Jesus said, everyone who hears my voice, or I'm sorry, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Christ's voice is truth, and we must hear him. So, so shall we stand with Pilate and say, what is truth? Shall we preach in a manner and means that says, well, now here's one position over here, and here's another position over here, and academically, there's some good points on this side of, of the matter of grace, and over here, there's some good, good academic points over here about, about obedience. You take your choice. You chew on it for a few years. You decide. And we walk away and think we preach the gospel. We haven't in the least just the opposite. The brethren, when our preaching is simply an academic endeavor to give different perspectives instead of proclaiming transformative truth that is absolute in God's will, we've already drifted. In John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There's the transformation as he spoke to his apostles. And so the principle even uh, comes to each of us through the gospel. It's power to save. But it's the power of truth. And, you know, Pilate goes on to illustrate exactly what we're describing. Because he, go, he went on to, to say, we went out to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him. Here's the truth. And yet he handed them over to their will instead of, standing in truth. Brethren, when we don't stand in truth, we open the door to the influences of the churches of men, the word and will of men, not the voice of Jesus Christ. Denominational influences develop and exist when we want to be like the churches around us. Of course, we remember Israel wanting and demanding a king in the days of Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verses 18 and 19, they refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And then, sadly, a, 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 some parallel ideas. We see this influence coming in from the churches around us. It, it's... It's, it's discouraging to, to hear at, from time to time brethren look to the denominational authors and influencers and say, oh, how spiritual they are. And yet the word of God teaches us to be spiritually minded is when we submit to 
and uh, the law of God, Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. There's a passage in Deuteronomy I want to bring your attention to. In Deuteronomy 12, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 12, verses 29 through 32. Lord our God, it says, When the Lord your God cuts off from you before the nations which you go in to dispossess, and, and you displace them and, and dwell in their land. So when God brings you into the land of Canaan and, and, and dispossesses the nations, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination of the Lord which he hates, they've done to their gods. They've burned even their sons and daughters in the fire in their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it, and you shall, you shall not add to it nor take away from it. That's as Israel of old who looked around and saw, saw and looked how the pagans were worshiping their false gods. And rather than worship the true God in his prescribed order, they said, I want to be like that. Uh, let's try worshiping God that way. Now, brethren, our, we must have closed eyes if we fail to see the similarity that at times infiltrates into the people of God in, in saying, well, we need that innovation or that innovation. I appreciate Brother David's good lesson about the pattern of worship for it, it lays out that people of faith follow God's pattern. And you see, these influences begin to, to find a foothold, a beachhead, and develop when we think, well, we're just, we, things are too stale. We, we, we just have this Church of Christ tradition, and we just need to, we need to broaden our concepts. Is that any different than Israel saying we want to try to worship Jehovah like the nations around us? Perhaps a study of Jeroboam would be good at this point. But time fails us to do that. So let's, let's talk some now and study a little bit about dealing with these influences. And, and to do that, uh, not to belabor the point, but to emphasize it, even as Paul said, for me to say the same things to you are not irksome, but for you it is safe. Let me re-state re, uh, the point that, brethren, we must be willing to identify the influences. We have to identify the influences and do more than simply say, oh, they're out there. We have to be able to identify what they are. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 4, Paul said, oh, that you would bear with me with a little folly, but indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste or pure virgin to Christ. Here's the purpose of what Paul's doing here in this context, is to present uh, the church pure unto Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. Now that's not simple-mindedness. That is the purity, the uncompounded, uh, unadulterated, or perfect uh, perfectness that's in Christ, and the purity that's in Christ. Well, where is this purity and, and simplicity that's in Christ? Well, verse 4 says, If he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached. So if we preach another Jesus, we're, not, we're straying from the simplicity that's in Christ. Or you receive a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You hold up again. You, re, you accept th these messages of another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, but to do that is to stray from the purity and the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to elaborate that error is subtle, just as he had said in verse 3. I'm, I'm concerned that as... Eve was deceived by the craftiness of the serpent. We will be deceived. We will, by the subtleness of error, be drawn away to receive false Jesuses, false spirits, false gospels that destroy souls. And so, and, and how does that happen? Well, let me just illustrate, for, for example, you know, Error is often cloaked in good intentions. Brethren may, for example, brethren say, well, 
you know, we're neglecting grace. We need to spend more time in studying grace, and of course we do, but we need the true grace of God, right? That Peter wrote about 1 Peter 5 and 12. But in swinging that pendulum too far, some have, have opened the door to, to unrestrained conduct, to misunderstandings of grace. And more on that in a little while as it moves toward this neo-Calvin Calvinism that we are, are seeing from place to place. But again, cloaked in good intentions, we need to have concern for our young people. Uh, our young people need to be exhorted, encouraged, and, and we need to have time for them. So what is happening now? Little by little, churches are beginning to, uh, as one in this region just over the weekend, hosted not just devotionals or studies, but social events hosted by an eldership and the church in the flyer, in the splash page on the Internet. Now, I, as Mark said, I grew up in the Methodist church, and we went to church camp, and, and we had a fellowship hall, you know, where we did recreational activities. Brethren, by what authority does a local church, does an eldership have the approval of Jesus to arrange and host social activities for our young people? But subtly it enters in because we care about our young people. We love our young people. We want to help our young people, and who doesn't? But does that mean at the expense of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the pattern that we're to hold fast? It cannot be. It must not be. It's subtle. Are we willing to identify the influences? Are we willing to fight the good fight, to contend earnestly for the faith? Or have we reached a point where we'll let that, you know, certain preachers do that, but I'm not going to get my hands dirty. It may affect me in some ways I just don't want to deal with. We've got to be willing to identify the influences, and that means at times we have to get specific to be able to know what they are, root them out, try to save souls, try to call people back to truth, and also to protect those who are innocent. So let's talk, talk specifically about some of these influences moving among us. I so much appreciated Brother Sean's lesson earlier this morning. If you were not here or able to hear that or see that, please go back and read his material, uh, listen to the lesson. Because brethren, a diminishing respect for and rejection of how to establish and apply Bible authority is a clear indicator of the influences moving uh, among some brethren that we must resist, we must identify and resist. Of course, Jesus has all authority, Matthew 28, 18. That authority has been revealed through his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, Ephesians 3, 3 and 4, in the revelation that we can read and understand and know the, the mystery of Christ. Whatever we do in word or in deed, we are to do all in the authority, or in the name of, by the authority, with the approval of Jesus Christ, Colossians 3 and verse 17. And yet, command, example, necessary inference is indeed scolded and ridiculed as unworkable, an unworkable legalism, a, a pattern theology, a blueprint hermeneutic, as stale Church of Christ tradition that we must, uh, must break away from. And so, and, and as, as has been referred to uh, a number of times, the work of... Uh, John Mark Hicks, searching for the pattern. Uh, there have been some important references given to you by, uh, by uh, Brother Sean uh, Cavender earlier this morning. I just want to share one with you uh, that's brief. And, and by the way, it's not like this was new with him. You know, Rubel Shelley and Randall Harris in their book, The Second Incarnation, uh, propagated this notion of a uh, Christocentric hermeneutic. Uh, that uh, and, and, and so uh, Hicks now has developed, elaborated, and expanded his concept that, that, that this, this you, God wants you to join his story, you know, join God's story. Uh, he said, for example, on one, page 103 of his book, uh, Searching for the Pattern, uh, the gospel is not a pattern of prescribed forms for the church. The pattern is Jesus, end quote. 
That's about as succinct as I could find in his writing of what this issue is all about. He says the, pattern, the gospel is not a pattern of prescribed forms for the church. Who's going to deny that, that the pattern is Jesus? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus has revealed that pattern for us in his gospel. Romans 6, 17 and 18 Thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, you became obedient to the heart, to that form, that pattern, that mold of teaching or doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. It is our obedience to a form, to that pattern of the gospel that releases us from sin's bondage to serve God in righteousness. And so... To suggest, to say, to propagate the gospel is not a pattern of prescribed forms is heresy. It is error that condemns, not enlightens. And it is troubling that brethren are recommending this book. We must identify this danger and we must warn our brethren and we must stand fast and hold the apostolic traditions even as we're exhorted to do so, 2 Timothy or 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The verses on the bottom of the chart, Acts the 15th chapter, and again, I appreciate Brother Cavender's comments about command, example, and necessary inferences. This is exactly how the apostles on that day in Acts 15, when the church was gathered together, this is exactly how they addressed the issue of whether or not to bind circumcision and the law of Moses upon Gentiles. We find uh, necessary inferences. We find uh, approved examples. We find direct statement of Scripture, each being applied to demonstrate truth. We don't have to go to the, the, the writings of men to try to formulate and suggest that this just came out of, of our own concepts. It is in the Bible. We need to study again Acts 15, 6 through 21 and the other many passages. You know, Jesus said on one occasion, you can, you can discern the, si the signs of the weather. You can, you can tell when the rain's coming, when the wind's going to blow, when it's going to be hot. How can, how can you not discern the sign of these times? Well, it might be because Philippians 1, 9 and 10 isn't being applied. We're not growing in our knowledge and discernment. But, but note then what he said. Why can you not judge what is right? How are we going to judge what is right? Because there's an absolute truth. It's the truth of the gospel, and that's the standard, that's the mold or pattern that establishes our right to act under the will of Jesus Christ. Brethren, this diminishing respect must be uh, countered. Philippians 4 and verse 9, the things that you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these things do, and the God of peace will be with you. We have responsibility to do what has been revealed by the apostles of Christ. Receive it. Hold it fast. Remember 2 Timothy 1, 13. Hold it fast. And so in doing, God will be with us. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. But brethren, another denominational influence among us we must recognize is distorted preaching. Preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, as we've already referenced. Brethren, when we, 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 this movement toward positivism in the pulpit of generalities and little or no application, these things are in direct contradiction to the the whole counsel of God we see in Scripture. Look at the preaching of Jesus, of John, Peter, and Stephen, of Paul. What did they, they identified truth and, and marked out sin. They rebuked sinners. They pleaded to sinners to repent and to obey God. Whether it was the Pharisees in Matthew 15... Or whether it was John before Herod in Mark 6 about his unlawful marriage. Or on the day of Pentecost as the apostles uh, set forth Jesus as Lord in Christ and urged repentance, commanded repentance and baptism in his name. 
to be saved. Or Stephen, as he indicted them of being stiff-necked, resisting the Holy Spirit, and for that lost his life even as John lost his head. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Brethren, let us embrace the one who tells us the truth. The wounds of a friend are good when they have at heart our salvation and God's will in our lives. Brethren, we, we are positively against error and sin. I, you know, it, may I suggest that we, we try to eliminate these self-serving descriptions of positive and negative? Someone says, well, rebuking is negative. No, I, I think that's positive. I need that. So let's get away from these self-serving descriptions and let's get back to Bible terms. The sound, wholesome words of Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 3. Speak things that are befitting sound doctrine, Titus 2 and verse 1. Let us speak as the Bible speaks and not be ashamed of that. That's, that's enough. That's necessary and needed. You know, when we refuse to identify false doctrine and teachers, that's distorted preaching. Mark those who cause divisions and occasion of stumbling contrary to the doctrine which you learned and turn away from them or avoid them. He says to do that, Romans 16, 18, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Error deceives, we've already noted that. He says, so we need to mark out, we need to take note, we need to identify those who cause division. Oh no, I, we can't name names. Don't do that. How are you going to mark those who cause divisions and occasions of offenses if you don't identify them? That's the very concept, is identity. And why do that? To avoid them. Why? Because of the influence of the error, because of the destructive nature of the error. Brethren, we've got to get back to this reality. Error, false doctrine, is sin. It's against the will of God. It's not a, a, an alternate view, an alternate opinion. Error is sin. If it violates revealed truth, it's a transgression of God's will. And if we're not willing and able to preach that, we need to get out of the pulpit and get, some, and get the proclaimers of truth to help us see the difference between error and error. In truth as God has revealed in his word. You know, when opinions and experiences and speculations, personalities, Brother, Dan, uh, Brother David Dan's lesson about testifying, the personal testimony, personal experiences, these are clearly denominational influences. When, when that becomes the focus of the preaching and, and, and these shades of personal testimonies are infecting pulpits that, you know... Now, and it's not just a new phenomenon. Over 25 years ago, I attended a gospel meeting in, in a location, and the preacher got up to, to speak, and almost the first words out of his mouth, and this is a pretty good quote, most of what you're going to hear me say tonight is my own opinion. My jaw dropped. Why did I drive 100 miles to hear a man's opinion? I don't want to hear a man's opinion. I want to hear, thus saith the Lord. And, and yet... That's, uh, you see what happens when we, when, we, when we preach opinion? You know what that does? That invites people to put their faith in men rather than their faith in Jesus and his truth, you see. We've got to recognize that. Well, another movement of denominational influences is the unity and moral and doctrinal diversity. Uh, this has been a, a battle of, of great import over, over much of my life, Galatians 1, 8 through 10, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any gospel to you other than that which we preach, let him be accursed, as I've said before, so say I now again, if anyone preaches unto you any gospel other than that 
which you received, let him be accursed. Am I now seeking to please men or God? Or do I seek to persuade, or persuade men or please uh, men or God? He says, if I were seeking to please men, uh, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a truth. There is an error. And yet the plea for unity, as great as unity is, when it comes at the expense of truth, it is no longer unity. It is union. It is tying the two tails of the cats together and throwing over the clothesline. That, that's union. That's not going to work very well. But you see, denominationalism in its very essence is a concept of uh, very often now, you know, you say, well, it's dividing and naming. That's true. But you see, the ecumenical movement is to bring these some core issues to bear. We'll, we'll agree on core elements and we'll all be united in Christ. And so ultimately, it's, it, it's the old, there are many roads to heaven. Choose the church of your choice and we'll all meet one great day. But agreeing to disagree over revealed truth, brethren, is the error of denominationalism and it leads to a broader fellowship. The Romans 14 error fosters a broader fellowship. Romans 14 was the battleground. The assertion was made, and I quote from Ed Harrell, The Bounds of Christian Unity in parts 3 and 4, when he wrote the right of brethren, he, is, uh, he wrote, asserted the right of brethren to differ in matters of faith and therefore to disagree, quote, in matters of considerable moral and doctrinal import, end of quote. And to do that without forfeiting fellowship. That was the whole appeal that, that we can disagree in matters of considerable moral and doctrinal import and not forfeit our fellowship. Now, may I ask a simple question? Who's going to define considerable for us? Issues of considerable moral and doctrinal import? Where, what, who's going to define that? It may be considerable to me, but not considerable to you. Where's that, where's that definition? Where's that application? You see, brother, what this... Uh, and, and divorce and remarriage was just the initial salvo in all this. That wasn't the end. No, we, we, have, we see these influences continue. The length of the days of creation. Well, here's one view. Here's another view. You take your pick. Is that what we render and... and render down the inspiration of scripture to is you choose this or this social drinking brethren are being uh, greatly tested with the temptation of social drinking well you know it's my faith I have my faith to God and after all isn't that what Romans 14 says you see in, in twisting and understanding of Romans 14 taking it out of the matters of liberties that are not sinful in and of themselves and in the areas of ju judgment where we can discern and make decisions concerning conscience and personal liberties and, and then trying to apply it to moral issues of a thus saith the Lord and the instruction from God's word, we distort the scripture and we give false assurances and hope and we lead people into sin. Dancing, immodest clothing, of course, you know Romans 14 has long been used as an appeal to justify homosexuality. And more and more, instrumental music, of course, and many other things. And why is that? Because, you see, the distortion of Romans 14 gives license to personal subjective faith concerning revelation when that's not what it teaches at all. Romans 14 is the right to act in a liberty without violating revealed truth and the respect of each other to do that even when we choose differently in those areas of liberty. It is a great chapter on unity, but we have to see the basis and the context of that unity is not in disagreeing over revealed truth of issues of moral and doctrinal import, but of things where God gives us a latitude of choice of liberty without sinning against him. Now, brethren, do we have the discernment to do that? To, to, to on the one hand, uh, or, or to, for example, not, not bind for the Lord is, has not bound? So, you know, 
factionalism, that's what ends up being factious, is when we bind where the Lord is not bound because we're going to bind my conscience on you. You know, a lot more can be said. I'm getting, I, I guess I've earned the right to go down a rabbit trail, but I'm going to come on back and not go down that trail any farther. But that, we've got to see the effect. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I do have to go back to, to a, boy, I went all the way back to the first. That's not what I wanted to do. Let me get over here. I was trying to come back to uh, a point that I didn't want to overlook. And that is, the response to some of this is, well, Joe, you know, everybody's off on something. It's pretty arrogant of you to think, and I've had said, it's pretty arrogant of you to think that you know all truth. I never said that. I said all truth is in Scripture. Or don't you know, you know, that nobody's 100% doctrinally pure. Never, I got that con, that response at times. Well, you see, I think false dichotomy is the phrase of the of the week. <laughs> here's here's my question on that: um, how much how much impurity can I have in my teaching and still be acceptable to Jesus? Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, how much can, of of the will of the Father, do I, do I not have to teach or teach something different than, and I'm still doing the will of the Father? See, it's a, it's a false construction. We're all growing. We're all learning. We're all uh, uh, improving in our knowledge and discernment. But that gives no right or quarter to error. It's not an either or. And we've got to be able to distinguish these, these uh, realities of truth. But... Subjective, direct, divine guidance is another influence that we see among us at times. God speaks to us in these last days in his son. But clearly there is, there is a lot of things being said along the way these days about the Holy Spirit. Uh, an important study is, is getting into what is the gift of the Spirit, Acts 2.38, Acts 3.19. Is it the Spirit as the gift or the gift the Spirit gives? I'm persuaded through the text is the, the gift the Spirit gives. Uh, and, and it parallels Acts 3.19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that so there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The Spirit himself revealed the promise of God that in the seed of Abraham all the nations would be blessed. Consider Galatians um, 3 and verse 14, many other verses on that. But we need to give serious time and study of the Holy Spirit, of, his, of who he is, of what his work is, uh, because we hear some uh, claiming uh, uh, messages from the Holy Spirit, uh, impulses and, and so forth from the Spirit. And, and we simply need to realize that, that Scripture says, don't be drunk, filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. Now, uh, how do you fill yourself with the Spirit? Well, with his product, with his word, Colossians 3 and verse 16. I'm going to go on in our discussion here about the influences of Calvinism. Uh, this has already been alluded to some, and again, I, uh, the, 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 the thought of Calvinism, of, of TULIP, it imbalances grace, faith, and works. It takes those out of balance. Uh, and, and again, that's these false choices, false dichotomies of grace and obedience, of faith and works, uh, misdefining and misapplying leads to much error. Galatians 1, 6 and 7 speaks directly really to uh, these concepts when it says, uh, I marvel that you are so quickly, you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Now a different gospel removes us from the grace of Christ, which is not another. There are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. A twisted, distorted, perverted gospel this, this, perverts and distorts the grace of Christ. And certainly Calvinism does that. But we, we, begin, we are hearing, seeing those winds blow among us. The idea that grace does not tolerate sin. We got, uh, I'm, sorry, uh, grace, I'm sorry, grace does not tolerate sin. Romans 6 and 1 says, any concept of grace that says sin uh, is somehow minimized, well, no, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. We who died to sin, how shall we any longer live in it? Grace does not tolerate and accept sin. It does not replace repentance. 
God commands all men everywhere to repent. Grace doesn't, doesn't remove the commandment to repent. We, can't, you know, we, we need to remember repentance in the plan of salvation. Repentance toward God, a change of heart fundamentally toward God that changes our heart toward sin to bear fruit of repentance rather than the works of the flesh. But let's get more specific into this because, you see, we sometimes, I've heard it say, brethren have said, well, you know, uh, I'm only human. Now, we understand that we don't have a sin nature because we are human. Romans 5, 12 uh, as through one man sin and entered the world, and death through sin, therefore sin, uh, death passed to all men, in that all have sinned. Sin is committed, it's not inherited. And yet we hear people say, well, I'm only human when, you, when we approach about sin. Well, I'm, what does that mean, I'm only human? I have to sin? No, sin's a choice. We choose to sin, and John writes about this in 1 John 1, 8, on into chapter 2. Uh, on the one hand, we're to say, he who says no, he has no sins, a liar, and the truth is not in him. As we walk in the light, we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins. But then John went on to say in verse 1, Brethren, these things I write unto you that you may not sin. You see? So, yes, you're human. But these things are written that we may not sin. God wants us to choose righteousness and be slaves of righteousness, servants of righteousness, not of sin and death. I want to share with you, brethren, some, some comments that trouble me uh, of, of uh, Brother Chris Emerson, who preached a little one. He, 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 I titled, subtitled this because he uses the phrase, a little once saved, always saved. In one of his sermons online, some of you I know know Chris, know him quite well. Um, I've seen no retraction to any of these things. If I'm misspeaking or misidentifying, I'll be happy to, to uh, make such correction, but in his sermon, uh, he said, Now, I'm not a, a proponent of the Calvinistic concept of once saved, always saved. You guys familiar? When I say once saved, always saved, you say, hmm, I don't like that. I'm not a proponent of that. That concept that you can go, to li uh, go live a life of sin again and return to all the things you were once doing and somehow still be saved is ludicrous. It's anti-biblical on every front from the garden on. Now, there's, that seems like a fundamental good statement it, that's that's error he says but I got a little once saved always saved in me can I tell you about it can I give you three minutes to tell you about it if you make me leave today I still got half the sermon in actually only two is it possible you guys don't know me super well but is it possible for me to once to be once saved always saved to never under any circumstances, in any way, ever, ever again, no matter what happens in the universe, ever return to a life of sin, you say, Chris, be careful. Sounds pretty arrogant. You need to watch out for that. But you know you might get tempted. You might return to what you were before Christ. And if you return to that life, you're going to lose your soul. Well, what if I told you this? What life? I don't know what life you're talking about. The life without Jesus, the life for me, the life of those things is gone. I died, man, died. I came, I came up new. You can't go back. It's over. If there's no life of sin I can ever see anymore, I am once saved and always saved because all there is is Jesus. And man, let me tell you, that's going to be true forever. Now, didn't Peter say that we can return to again be entangled in the things that we were once in? 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. Didn't the word of God say that we can develop an evil heart of unbelief and falling from the living God? Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 and many other passages. Now, I, I don't know the motives. I don't know the man personally. I'm just looking at the issue. And the issue is alarming. The words are alarming. That brethren would accept this kind of thought. Of course we have assurance in Christ. But what is our assurance in Christ when we walk in truth? First John 5, John said, These things I write unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. And that life is in the Son. But John talked about a walk in the light. 
in truth and righteousness. Shades of Calvinism or Neo-Calvinism. That was in his sermon, Unless It Dies. It's online. I encourage you to listen to it yourself. I'm also concerned about imputation of righteousness because, you see, Brother Emerson has also taken Romans 10 and verse 3 and uh, uh, that speaks of the means by which God counts sinners righteous. And instead, discussing it in terms of God's righteousness and, and suggested that God sees you as holy even though you're not holy. And that God does not see you as you are, but as he is. Now, Romans 4, verse 5, it is our faith that's accounted to us for righteousness. Not the righteousness of God that's accounted to us for righteousness. Again, in this context, he said, By living Romans 10, 9, and 10, we're offering ourselves over to God's righteousness. But I will put my righteousness, I will put my righteousness on you. God will see you as righteous as he is. I will, I will see you as holy, though you are not holy, just because you've yearned for a relationship with Jesus. Now let that sink in. God, he says, God says, I'll see you as holy, though you're not holy, because you yearn for a relationship with Jesus. You say, now you've aggravated the law keepers in the room who say, we talk too much about grace, God's righteousness. We need to just get out there and get it done. But he goes on to say, God doesn't see you as you are, but as he is. Don't you get it? Now, he's talking about the same person. <laughs> that, that God's, that you're not righteous, but God will see you as righteous. It's his righteousness offered to you, he went on to say. The old law was a resume of your righteousness, but in the new law, only God's righteousness is in view. All my sinful record is taken away and replaced with the righteousness of the Lord. I want his goodness laid upon me. Now, brethren, our faith is counted to us for righteousness. Romans 4, 5, Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark unto the saving of his house, that he might become an heir of the righteousness that's according to faith. What's the righteousness according to faith? God's righteousness put on Noah? It was Noah's righteousness that prepared the ark when God called him to obey. When God commanded him, by faith he obeyed, and that was the, the faith counted to him for righteousness. Why would God say, be holy as I am holy, if you can't be holy? First Peter 1, 15 and 16. Brethren, these winds are blowing. We need to be able to identify them. These are the issues. It's nothing about the man. I'm talking about the issues. We've got to identify those issues and call brethren to, to truth and make these distinctions. Well, time is about up. How do we guard against these things? We've got to take personal responsibility to mature. 2 Peter 3, 6 through 18. We need to test all things. Hold fast what's good. We need to, to use the apostolic measure, 1 John 4, 1 and verse 6. When we don't, we'll twist scripture to our own destruction. If we're going to guard against these influences, we must be watchful. Paul called upon the Ephesian elders to watch in Acts 20, 31. The evangelist Timothy is told, you be sober or watchful in all things. 1 Corinthians 16, the Corinthians were told to stand fast, watch. God set watchmen on the walls of Zion. They shall never hold their peace. They shall not be silent. Brethren, God put apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, and each Christian are to be alert on the walls of Zion for the enemy's approach that will destroy souls. That's the enemy's objective, destruction of our souls. We have to demand preaching that makes application from God's word. Brethren, can I just say for a moment, we've got to remember and preach the gospel invitation. Brethren, how does somebody know if they have a need if we haven't explained what their need is? And you say, well, well everybody already knows. Who am I to make that assumption? 
If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and confess it. You need to repent toward God and of your sin against Him. You need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Are we hearing that in the, in the invitations? Are we appealing to people to put sin away and to live for Jesus in His pattern, of, in His form of doctrine revealed in the Gospel? Indeed, we need to expose error and give it no quarter. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even reprove or expose them. When we do that, we try to do it explaining and understanding that it's about souls. It's about truth and error. It's not an attack upon a person. It's not, but, but far from it to try to snatch some out of the fire. Try to save souls. Rather than to guard against these influences, we must practice corrective discipline. Something's already been talked about at some length in these lectures. We must remember this commandment. We must see that it's not the forgotten commandment because it's God's correction, God's instruction that shows our love, demonstrates our faith as we seek to save the lost and protect the saved. We must finally refuse fellowship with the enemies of truth if you abide in my word then you're truly my disciples you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free and so second john 9 through 11 john elaborates whoever goes onward and does not abide in the doctrine of christ does not have god he that abides in the doctrine has both the father and the son Many souls have escaped denominational error to be saved in Jesus Christ. We cannot turn back to these corrupting errors that overthrow faith and condemn souls. Like Hymenaeus and Philetus, who had, in their false doctrine were corrupting the faith of some. Brethren, we have to give the more earnest heed to the word of God that we have heard, spoken through his son, lest we drift away. We cannot neglect those things spoken by the Lord proclaimed by his apostles and prophets, confirmed by the Holy Spirit through the miracles that revealed and then inspired and, con and validated that saving message. May God grant us the wisdom, the knowledge of his word, and the strength of faith to see and to fight against these things in the good fight of faith. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe, for an excellent lesson, one that soberly calls us to preach the truth in love for souls, for the Word of God, and, and for the Christ whom we serve. We'll be dismissed. Five minutes from now, we'll reconvene. Ladies are going to go to their separate track. Sherilyn Mayberry, my wife, will be teaching that session for all the ladies that would like to go there. There's children's uh, classes that will be held in the library, and those that wish to remain here uh, come back for in five minutes, and we will begin the session with Brother Max Dawson. Thank you.
If you would begin making your way to your seat, we're a little past time, but it is time for us to begin. And uh, for those who are live streaming, let me just mention that if you are wanting to find the ladies class, that's available on our YouTube channel. We can't do Facebook and YouTube with two things at the, we can't do Facebook with two things at the same time, so that's why we have to do it that way. But as these are archived and saved, they'll be available uh, on Facebook and on the Truth Lectures website. Let me mention, if you haven't already gotten a book, that all of this good material we've, we've been looking through this week is in the book. And of course, during the time that our speakers present their lessons, we're, they're not able to get to everything. But that's a great resource and a special price this week that uh, will not be true uh, once the week's over. So if you haven't already got one, uh, be sure and, and get that book. Our next speaker is Brother Max Dawson. If you were here yesterday for the open forum, you got a foretaste of uh, what Max has to say and uh, the good material that he'll offer to us. Um, when we were talking about this track, which we're calling a practical track, working together, and this last session that's dealing with uh, developing leaders, um, Brother Max has focused on that a good deal in his last uh, several years, and he was very excited to do this. In fact, let me commend to you a book that he has done, published by Florida College Press. We have several available out on their table, and it is called Kingdom Leaders. Back in 2015, I think, was the first occasion that I had to meet Brother Dawson. Uh, he came to the Truth Lectures uh, that was dealing with evangelism, refocusing on evangelism, and he had an excellent lesson in that material, which is, I think, at the bookstore, it's still available, and you could access that. Um, Brother Dawson preached for a number of years at Dowland Road. He has attempted, he said, to retire. He still serves as an elder there, and he still does lots of meeting work. And he told me just a moment ago that the, the notion of retiring turned out to be kind of a joke. He's still staying pretty busy. He's here with his wife, Lee, and she's a great support to him. Uh, but I'll turn things over to Brother Max. Let me just remind you that as we're doing it in this session, We'll have 45 minutes for the lecture. We'll extend that perhaps a little bit because we're getting started later. Um, but then we'll have discussion period that'll go after that for the max. Well, good morning, my friends. And thank you, Kyle, for the introduction. Kyle called me several months ago and asked me if I would be willing to speak on this forum. And you know, when you have several months before you have to show up and do it, you think, hey, you know, I can do anything in five or six months, you know, it's plenty of time. I remember it was in February of 1970, Mike Willis called me and said, Max, in about seven weeks from now, I'm going to be in a gospel meeting. I want you to speak for me at Mooresville on Sunday evening when I'm gone. And I thought, well, seven weeks away gives me plenty of time. And that was my first sermon on April the 5th, 1970. It was a big weekend for Lee and me because she had a baby on Friday. And I did my first sermon on Sunday. I agreed to be a part of this in, in talking with Kyle. And then he said, I want you to come up with a manuscript. Now, Kyle didn't know that when I graduated from Miss Falvey's English class in high school, about all I could do was write my first name, print my first name with a big red crayon. But I put together a manuscript, and I sent it to Kyle and Mark, and it came back to me with more red marks than Miss Falvey ever put on any of my papers in English. So they cleaned it up. But I'll tell you what they didn't do. <laughs> 
They didn't fix my speaking ability, so I'm liable to just dirty it all up again. I'm talking about today and tomorrow. Because what we're doing today determines where we're going to be tomorrow. We're about future leadership, developing spiritual leadership within the church. Almost every week I have opportunity to talk to someone who has chosen a wrong course in life. And in my Bible studies with those individuals, I typically tell them, if we're turned on here, I typically tell them, Toward the wall? Okay, we're not doing well on this. Can you advance my slide for me? Hit it. See if you can make it work, brother. Then I say to them, come on. You will be where you are tomorrow because of choices you make today. Uh, and, and that fits ver very well with the concept that's found in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. The principle there reminds us that whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And what is true with individuals, to some degree, is true with churches. It's possible to say to a congregation, you are where you are today because of choices you made yesterday. And you will be where you are tomorrow because of your choices you're making today. And we need only to look to the past to see the validity of that truth. You know, we want to blame circumstances, blame people, blame society, blame the times that we're in, but it's choices. And we have to make good choices now. Every year I have opportunity to visit a number of churches across America, uh, from California to Florida, all over the Midwest. And I see three kinds of churches. I see some that are declining and are not going to survive. I see some that are holding their own and they're doing reasonably well, but then I see some, some churches that are growing, they're thriving and they're flourishing. But among those churches that are declining, there are five things that I have observed in declining churches. Now, I'm going to list those five things very quickly. and You may be able to list more things than these five. But first of all, there's a failure to aggressively do the work of evangelism. We are about saving souls. And if we're not aggressively doing that work, how do we expect? Well, we're not fulfilling the Lord's mission. We are on a mission from God. You know, I used that language at home several years ago. We are on a mission from God. And there was a chuckle that went through the congregation, and I thought, what, what is that about? I, I didn't know. Someone afterwards said, well, you know, the Blues Brothers, that's what they said. I'd never seen the Blues Brother, Brothers movie, but I know this. In reading my Bible, I know that we are on a mission from God, and that mission is to do evangelism and to do it in a way that reaches out to the most people possible. But when you don't do the work of evangelism, you're not going to be part of a thriving, flourishing church. Secondly, a failure of brethren to be at peace with one another. And this is one that really bothers me a lot. I, I called a brother last night in Texas, uh, a brother I've known for 40-some years. And he was prepping to go to worship, but he said, you know, I dread going. I've always loved going to church, going to Bible class, but I dread go, going because our congregation is not at peace. And it grieves me in my soul to sit there with brethren who are fighting one another. You see that in declining churches. And then this, a failure to keep the young people of the church. You see that in declining churches. And then a failure to adapt our methods to cultural changes. Our culture is constantly changing. Now, we don't adapt the message. Our message is stable. It's always the same. But the way we do things, the means that we use in, in reaching people, the, the media and things of that na nature, our methods, we have to adapt those to the current culture. 
And if you've got questions about that, please fire those questions at me during the Q&A session. And then finally, a failure of leadership to prepare for the future. You see this in declining churches. Now, lest I paint with too broad a brush, there are some churches that are not failing on any of these points. They're doing extremely well, and those are the churches that are flourishing and thriving. But you can see that with a failure on these things, the future for a church that's failing in these things is not going to look bright. Why do these five things exist in so many local churches? John Maxwell and others have said this, everything rises or falls on leadership. When I first heard that statement from Maxwell about 30 years ago, I questioned its validity. I thought, well, a lot of things rise or fall on leadership. And, and I guess what people want to do when they see that statement, well, I think I can find an exception to that. Okay, if you can find an exception, that's okay. But experience shows that in a very broad way, everything rises or falls on, on leadership. It's that way uh, in, in government. It's that way in the military. It's that way on the, on the ball field. Leadership is critical. In southeast Texas, where I live, in 1980, a little over 40 years ago, there were 18 congregations in our immediate area. And, and let me say that what I'm about to say uh, may hurt some people's feelings. I don't intend that. Simply looking at reality, I'm not trying to upset anyone. But there were 18 congregations in our, uh, in our immediate area. Today there are seven. In the space of 40 years, about 60% of those congregations have closed their doors. And of the seven that still exist, at least three are declining. And if current trends continue in another 10 or 12 years, it's possible that only three or four of those congregations will exist. Now, someone might object and say, well, aren't there more Christians today than there were 40 years ago? No, they're not. There were a little more than 1,600 Christians in 1980 uh, among conservative churches in our immediate area. Today, only about 1,000. In, in those cases, when those churches close their doors, it goes back to leadership. None of those churches plan to fail. They just failed to plan. They didn't develop spiritual leadership. They failed to develop the next generation of leaders. I will tell you that Southeast Texas is not North Alabama. You guys have so many churches and churches that seem to be flourishing. I don't know if churches in North Alabama have been failing or not. But I know the circumstance in Southeast Texas. And I know the circumstance in a number of other places across the country. Leadership is the key to a church's future. Will a congregation survive and thrive? When shepherds and other leadership within a local church do not plan for the future, they're going to be victims of the future. Let me talk to you just for a moment about Paul's admonition to the Ephesian elders. And I know I have crammed a lot of text here uh, on, on this slide. This is from Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 27 and down to verse 32. If you can't read this from where you are, please open your Bible and read this. But what I want you to see as I read it together with you is how many times in this simple text, a text that we're very familiar with for the most part, how many times Paul is talking about the future? He said, I have not shown to declare to you the whole counsel of God. There he's talking about what he has done already with those brethren. But he says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, 
and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. As I read that text, how many times did you see the future being referred to there? He said, take heed to yourselves. He's talking about what they're going to do from this time forward. He's about to leave them. Take heed to yourselves. So he's talking about the future. He says to shepherd the church. He's telling them what they're going to do in the days to come. He says, after my departure, Paul is leaving. What are you going to do? He said, you're going to face this problem. Savage wolves are going to come in among you. He's talking about the future. He says, even among yourselves, men will rise up. He's talking about the future. He says, so watch. You don't just watch for today. You plan to watch for tomorrow. You remember what Paul has said in the past, and you apply it as you look forward. He says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able. He's talking about the future, able to build you up. There was so much being said here in this text. Paul is warning these brethren about the future. Dangerous days are ahead. They had to look to the future, and so do we. There absolutely must be future thinking. That's what Paul uh, said to uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, the things that you've heard from me among many witness, witnesses, the same commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's your job, Timothy. You have been instructed by me. I've taught you among many witnesses. I've not only taught you, but I've taught others. Now, you, Timothy, and these other young men that I've taught, you need to get yourselves some men just like I got some men, and you need to instruct them so they can teach others. Paul is thinking about the future in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. These Ephesian elders... These Ephesian elders, would they just let happen whatever would happen? Or would they truly be shepherds and lead the flock of God through these difficult times? What if you were a shepherd in the Ephesian church? What would you do if you were there? Would you be on guard? Would you be watching for the well-being of souls? Well, you can't be an elder in that church. If you're an elder today, what are you doing in your own congregation to protect the church from those savage wolves and from those men in, in the church who might be rising up to draw away disciples after themselves? The answer that Paul gives to this problem is found in verse 32. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. You know, this really reminds me of what happened in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 when the apostles said, look, we're not going to serve the tables. We will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. Prayer and the word of God. Those two things must work together. Spiritual leaders must trust God and spend time daily in God's words. And, and this isn't just a matter of setting an example for the flock. I'm talking about genuine trust in God. God didn't give us this word just to memorize it. No, that's good. God didn't give us this word just so that we could set an example for others. We have this word so that we can trust God. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which will build you up. We trust that God hears and answers our prayers. And we trust that the way he has given us is the only right way. But if we're going to be on guard about the future, we've got to know the word of God. I'm reminded of Titus chapter 1. In Titus chapter 1, in beginning at verse 9 and down to verse 11 here, the apostle speaks concerning uh, these issues that, that they might face. And he says this in Titus, in verse chapter 1 and verse 9, he says you need to hold fast. He's talking to shepherds. You need to hold fast the faith, faithful word as you've been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort, to convict those who contradict. 
for their many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. So the shepherd has got to be on guard. He's got to know these false teachers that might come in from outside and influence the flock. He's got to be ready for them. But what about those within the flock? When error might rise up among some of the members of the flock or when error might be taught by the, the preacher in the flock. He's got to be on guard and be ready to deal with all those things. And so the Ephesian elders here, they've got to look to the future and they've got to be watchful. The question is, who's going to lead the congregation, your congregation? Not the church at Ephesus, but who's going to lead your congregation five years, 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years from now, when churches do not think about future leadership, they almost certainly will find themselves in situations and places where they do not want to be. I don't know the circumstance of churches in North Alabama, but I do know of a number of churches across the country that used to have elders and no longer have elders today. What's the reason for that? Why did that happen? It's because they did not look forward and they did not provide for more elders. They didn't provide for more teachers, didn't provide for more preachers. And when that's the case, when the church is not looking forward, when the brethren who lead the church are not looking forward, it is not a good thing. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, the things you've heard of me among many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's a mission that we all have from God. But why is it that we sometimes just don't look to the future? What's the reason for that? Well, sometimes it's because the present elders are just overwhelmed with their present problems and, and challenges. Over, overseers find themselves to be overloaded with issues. You know, in the past 10 to 20 years, a lot of elderships have given up on the thing of be, just being business managers and decision makers for the church. They've become shepherds, which is what God intended for them all along. But sometimes they find themselves being overwhelmed with problems. I, I was in, uh, in Florida, uh, traveling with my wife uh, about six years ago and I had a uh, an elder from a church call me and didn't know I was in Florida but he said he said um, we're trying to shepherd the flock as best we can but brother Max we're having more problems today than we've ever had before more problems with family issues where people are not getting along. Problems with moral issues, pornography, uh, uh, people having sex outside of marriage, money issues, you name it. We're having all those problems. And so I went and talked to them for a little bit since they were in Florida. I was in Florida. And what I learned was that, no, you're not having more problems today than ever before. It's just that you didn't know about the problems when you were off in a room making decisions and not interacting with the sheep. But the more you interact with the sheep, the more problems you're going to realize that you have. And so some, some elders do not want to look to the future because they're overwhelmed with the current problems. They feel already that they're overburdened. And now if we've got to think about the future and training more men, that's just more problems on top of what we've already got. A second problem is that it's just easier not to do it. It's easier to say, let's live with the status quo. That's the comfortable thing to do. You know, everything's going along okay right now. The church is at peace. Let's not do something to rock the boat. Let's not talk about future leaders because that could cause us to have some problems. Well, if you're not going to think about futures today, the future leaders, what event tomorrow is going to cause you to think about future leaders? And, and in such a circumstance, you're not really maintaining the status quo because if your present status is you have strong elders, then you've got to have strong elders in the future. And if you don't plan for that, then you're not going to maintain your present condition. 
Another issue is that some elders, some elderships, don't want to relinquish authority. We're in charge here. We make all the decisions, and we don't want to give that authority to someone else. That's why we're not thinking about future leaders. We're happy with the way things are. And, and this goes right along with the fourth reason that some don't understand. Though they may be shepherds, they don't understand their role. You know, if someone thinks that the eldership is about having power, then they misunderstand the role. They don't want to give that power to someone else. And of course, it's not about power. It's about the people. It's about seeing to the needs of the sheep. There's a fifth reason why we're not looking to the future, and that is because we recognize the potential danger. And, and, and I say that, let me explain, that I think appointing elders is one of the most dangerous things that a local church ever does. Because you realize that you may have a brother over here or one over there who says, I should be an elder in this church. I want to get my hands on the wheel. I can make decisions better than our current elders. See, he thinks it's all about decision making. And when, when we start the process of training and getting ready to appoint more elders, this guy says, I want, I'm the man. I, I need to be an elder in this church. And sometimes the current elders say, you know, it's better for us to do nothing rather than to have to deal with this guy. Because if we don't make him an elder, we know he's going to raise a ruckus in the church. Better off to do nothing than deal with that guy. And then this, factions within the local church. You know, it's one of the reasons that a lot of churches never have elders in the first place. Because if you've got a faction over here and a faction over there, and we bring up the thing of, of appointing elders... Well, it just might be that someone from that faction over there is going to be put forward, and we're not going to let him be an elder. But they're saying the same thing over there about someone over here. And so sometimes when you've got factions in a local church, you don't have elders in the first place. But when you do have elders and you've got the factions, well, we're not going to raise the prospect of appointing more men because it might mean that we would have to appoint someone from this faction or that faction. When factions exist in a local church, it almost always involves a power struggle. Who is going to call the shots? Who is going to be in, in control? We make such a mess of things when we have a party spirit in the local church. We bring shame and disgrace on God's cause because of our own selfishness and ambitions. I'm reminded of Paul's warning in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 when he said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than himself. We don't have the luxury, the luxury of every man, every faction getting its own way, every man getting his own ego stroked. In fact, that's not a luxury at all. It is sinful, shameful, and disgraceful. Paul gives the warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 and following about factionalism within the local church. Where is the Spirit of Christ that should exist in every one of us? It is God's plan that Christ be formed in us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. If you look right in the middle of that verse, it is God's plan that we be conformed to the image of His Son. And that will eradicate factionalism. If you've been a part of a faction, if I've been a part of a faction in a local church, we need to abandon it and abandon that immediately without delay. Local churches and souls are being destroyed because of power struggles. May our Lord Jesus Christ forgive us. And may our Lord Jesus Christ truly be formed in each of us. Uh, a final thing that I would note as to why churches aren't looking to the future is they have no plan. No training. They just say, well, okay, maybe it should be done, but not now. Someone says, well, that's not us. You know, we have training classes. We have men's training in our church. That's great. But I hope that leadership is part of that training. 
Because if all you're doing is teaching men how to read Scripture and how to pray publicly, you're not really addressing the real leadership issues. Maybe you can think of some more reasons why elderships don't plan for the future. Instead of looking for more reasons, let's look at how we can encourage and promote the development of, of more leaders. We absolutely must work to develop future leaders. And I realize a little problem with the slide there, but you get the point, don't you? We've got to do this. Otherwise, we'll wind up without shepherds to lead the flock of God. Let's talk about Jesus. And I think I'm going to have a problem on this slide also. But Jesus has a model for developing leaders. You know, for three and a half years, Jesus worked with those 12 men in order that they might carry out his mission. In that short period of time, Jesus didn't focus merely on gaining followers. You know, when he left to go back to heaven, he had about 120 people who were faithful to him. And if all he was doing was trying to get followers, well, that wasn't a very good showing. Instead, he focused on training a few men to do his work after he left planet earth. In passages like Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Jesus said, I'm going to send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He's warning them of, about the kind of world that they're going to go out into. Jesus spent three and a half years prepping them for that. And, and not only did Jesus equip these 12 men, the apostles did the same thing. Peter, Paul, James, and John, they taught thousands to follow Jesus. But a lot of what they did was prepping others to lead. They were more than followers of Jesus. They did indeed follow him. But they were mentoring others to do the kind of work that they were doing. When you consider the work of the Apostle Paul from chapter 13 of the book of Acts onward, you ha hardly ever find Paul by himself. It's a rare thing that when you find that. He started off uh, with Barnabas and uh, with uh, John Mark in Acts 13. And then on his second journey, he goes out with Silas. And he barely gets started with Silas. He comes to Acts 16. And he picks up Timothy as part of his group. And then later in that chapter, you see that Luke is part of that traveling group when Paul went to Troas in Acts 20. He's got at least seven men traveling with him. And, and what were these people? Were these people that were simply co-workers with Paul? They were co-workers, but more. Paul was training them. He was doing what he taught Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things you've heard from me among many witnesses commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you've got Jesus training his apostles, then the apostles training others. And now Paul says to Timothy, you train others. And now the work falls to us. We're the ones who must do that. We must mentor others. We have a mission to equip the next generation. According to Jesus, there's a need for more workers. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and following, Matthew 9, Jesus saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. They were scattered like sheep having no shepherds. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. There's not enough workers. Pray, therefore, the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his field. We've got a worker shortage. And so by training others, we're helping to impact the future. That's what, that's what shepherds need to do. Listen, if you're a shepherd, you are a leader who leads others to lead. You shepherd others to do the work of shepherding. If you're a preacher, you need to be teaching others to do evangelism like you're doing. If you're a deacon, you need to train others to take your place. Jesus planned beyond the present. That's the point I would make. I'm going to give you just a handful of things, and I'm going to do these very briefly because I'm not going to go over on my time. First of all, you need to see the potential of the people around you. If you want to be like Jesus, 
That's what Jesus did with the 12. Jesus looked at those men and did not see them as they were so much as he saw them what they could be. He took deeply flawed men and changed them by his life and by his teaching. And we can do the same. Jesus took men who quarreled among themselves and he taught them how to get along with one another. He took selfish, prideful men, men who were opinionated, and he, he taught them to work together so that they could take the gospel to the whole world. These men needed training, equipping. That's what he did. He trained them. He equipped them so they could do that. And we need to do the same thing. Don't look at the people around you and see them just as they are, but see them as they can be. See their potential. Secondly, Jesus looked for the best potential leaders, and that's what we have to do. Jesus didn't try to make everyone an apostle. Why not? Not everyone would make a good apostle. Not everyone could be qualified to be an apostle. But he looked for the best potential leaders. And when we look to train men to be shepherds, that's what we need to look for. Look for men who are already doing that kind of work. Men who show a love for the sheep and are trying to encourage the sheep. That's the kind of men that we should look for. Not merely men who can make a good decision as to what color we paint the walls. Leave that to someone else making that kind of decision. Look for men who show concern and care for others. Have training classes that teach men about leading, not just leading from the pulpit and reading Scripture, but how to deal with people and how to show love for people, how to care for people. And when you do that, you're going to weed out some of those that cannot, be, that cannot be elders. Be patient with those that you train. The patience of Jesus, I think, is remarkable. How many times did he have to correct Peter? What about, uh, what about James and John? How many times did they fail him? I like Matthew chapter 16 because in, in, verse, number, uh, in verse number 18, in there, uh, Jesus is talking with Peter and says, upon this rock I will build my church. What rock? Well, the rock was the confession that Peter had just made, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a powerful and potent statement that is, the Christ, the Son of God. But then a few verses later, Peter thinks he has to correct Jesus because Jesus is wrong about what he thinks is going to happen in the future. Got to go to Jerusalem going to be killed by the chief priests and scribes. Th things like that must have grieved Jesus when his apostles try to correct him. What about James and John when they want to be elevated above the others, one on the right hand, one on the left? Jesus had to deal with those men. He didn't give up on them, but through time and teaching, he made those men to be what he wanted them to be. So be patient with those that you train. Treat those you mentor as individuals. That's what Jesus did with the 12. You know, in, in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus is spending time with the apostles as, as individuals. You know, he often dealt with the large crowds, thousands who followed him. But in John chapter 14, Jesus is about to go away. His ministry is coming to an end. He's going to die. He's going to be raised from the dead and ascended back to heaven. But he's giving comfort to the disciples and explaining to the apostles that it's for their benefit that he goes away. And here he is just with the 12. And he spends this personal time with them, mentoring them individually. First, it was, it was Thomas who had a question for him. And Thomas asked him in verse number 5, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas says, I'm the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. But from now on, you know him and have seen him. Then it's Philip. See, Jesus is answering these, he's treating these men as individuals. 
Philip, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient. And Jesus says, have I been so long time with you, Philip, and you've not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is demonstrating his compassion for individuals. One of the most tragic chapters in the Bible is in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 34, in those first 10 verses. There God rebukes the shepherds in Israel, the prophets, the princes, the priests, and the kings, because they cared not for the sheep. They let the individual sheep go astray. They let them, they let them be food for the wolves. Jesus teaches compassion for the individual and he does that. That's what we've got to do as we mentor. We've got to train men about the value of the individual. And we can model the value of the individual as we mentor those men that we think have potential by giving them personal attention. And then this point, invest time in individuals. That, that sounds like the previous point, but it's not really. You've got to spend time with people. You know, for the past 20 years or so, there's been an awful lot said about quality time over quantity time. And, and I, don't, I don't demean the value of quality time, but I just wonder how much quality time you can have with someone if you don't invest quantity of time. And Jesus gave so much time to those that he was trying to mentor. And this means as if you're trying to mentor men to be shepherds in the flock of God, you've got to spend hours with them, studying with them, praying with them, working and teaching them. That's what Jesus did. He gave them the gift of time. And then as we follow Jesus as our model, don't be afraid of the ask. What do I mean by that? I mean Jesus asked for an enormous equip uh, an enormous commitment from the 12. He didn't water down what he expected of them. In, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 28, Peter said, we have left all to follow you. And that's what Jesus expected. And that's what they did. Peter recognized that fact. Sometimes I think we're afraid to tell people, you've got blood, sweat, and tears ahead of you if you're going to become a shepherd. Because it's not an easy thing to do. And, and we're sometimes afraid to tell their family, listen, you may have to give up your husband, your dad for two, maybe even sometimes three nights a week so that he can do the work of shepherding the flock of God. We need to be plain and upfront about that. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't afraid to ask for that big commitment. And then last, prepare them to succeed. Jesus believed in the success of his kingdom. His words in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. He's talking about his death. My death is not going to prevent me, not going to prevent me from establishing my church. I'm going to be successful. Jesus would establish a kingdom that will outlast the planet earth. Daniel 2, 44, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will last forever and ever. Jesus intended to be a success, and he was a success. In John chapter 8 and verse 14, he said, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. He knew that his mission on earth would be a success. Listen, don't ever listen to these, these people uh, who get involved in premillennialism, who see Jesus as a failure, the gospel as a failure, the church as a failure. Jesus was an imminent success in what he intended to do. And he believed in the success of his apostles. He gave them their marching orders in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus did not envision them as failing. As we mentor kingdom workers today, we need to instill within them a spirit that believes in the success of God's work. Jesus was not sent into this world to fail, and he didn't send his apostles out to fail, and he does not envision us failing in our mission to preach the gospel. 
There's so much more we could say about that. Let me give you my final little thought here. And it's not going to look right on the slide, but it is what it is. Before you do any of these things, make disciples. If you're a preacher, if you're a shepherd, if you're a Bible class teacher, if you're a deacon, whatever you are, our mission is to make disciples because it's from disciples that leaders come. We teach people to follow Jesus, to be like him. We imitate our master. And the more we are like our master, the more prepared we are to be kingdom leaders. So much more we could have said. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Hey, would you mind just expanding on what you said about adapting to cultural changes? Yeah, well, our culture is constantly changing. We are not where we're, we're our culture is not where it was in 2010. And you look at the family, the family is constantly changing. But also the way we reach people is changing. You know, when, when I was preaching in Kokomo, Indiana, we had a little thing in the yellow pages, a little thing up in the corner. You open to the churches in, in the Kokomo uh, directory, and there we were, Cortland Avenue Church of Christ. We were right up in the corner. And in the year 1976, I was called Marion Max because I married so many people. When people were looking for a preacher, they're going to go to the yellow pages to find a church uh, find a preacher if they don't have one. And so there we were, right in that upper corner. And we got a lot of visitors from that, too. People used to look for the yellow pages. That doesn't work any longer. Times have changed, and our culture has changed. We need, we live in the dig digital age, and we need a first-class website, because the, your website is one of your, it's, it's been called the front door to your church. If I individually invite someone to come to Dallin Road Church, they may show up, but first they're going to check out the website to learn something about who and what we are. You see, our culture is changing. We never change the, me the message. The message is static. The message is stable, constant. But the way we approach people and the way we have to deal with circumstances our culture is constantly changing. I, I have a lesson that I sometimes do in my leadership weekends uh, where I just talk about cultural change and how we must respond to cultural change. But the message always remains the same. It used to be you could put an advertisement in the paper that says gospel meeting down at the corner of 4th and Main. Everybody come. And people would show up from a newspaper advertisement. It's not so, it doesn't, doesn't work so well today. Social media is important. So we've got to change, we've got to change with those times, but never change the message. There's a whole lot more that could be said about that, but that's the basic that I'm thinking. Any other questions? Is it legit for Mark and Kyle to ask questions? I'm not sure. We'll try to be gentle. Uh, just a passing remark. It wasn't to sit around and study Jewish writings. And so in your training of preachers and your development of men for prospective service as elders, the literature we turn to what, what observations would you offer about good sources of spiritual growth and dangerous sources of spiritual growth? Well, I think our, I think our brother addressed some of that in the previous study about denominational problems, denominational coming into the church. And, uh, you know, you look at the first century church, you've got people coming from Judaism and from paganism. 
And a lot of those people are bringing in their own ideas, the paganism of uh, what, in, when Paul talks about, I guess it's 1 Corinthians chapter 4, about the uh, problem with idols. Uh, you've got the Jewish influence with circumcision. You've got to be aware of these things. Today, people come to us from Roman Catholicism. People come to us from denominationalism. People come to us from just nothingism, you know, people who don't have any connection at all, who realize they need to be connected to God. And so all those people, they bring baggage with them. And we've got to know, uh, we've got to understand something about Catholicism. And, you know, sometimes people are going to call the preacher. Uh, we have one sister who just couldn't get away from calling me a priest or the pastor of the church because she came out of Roman Catholicism. And I said, look, uh, I said, use terms like evangelist, call me preacher. If you're going to use the term pastor, mean it in the sense that I'm one of these shepherds, one of the elders of the church. And she said, well, you know what I mean. I said, I know, I think I know what you mean, but I want to make sure that I know what you mean. Because when you call me pastor or priest and you in introduce me as the pastor of the Dallas Road Church, I'm not sure you know. And so you've got to be prepared for these denominational ideas that will come in. And as far as sources, uh, I would point to some of the Robert Harkrider books. I think Harkrider has done a good job on uh, addressing false doctrine, break basic principles, if you want to look at that. Some of the older material, uh, look at some of the writings from Roy Conkle. And look, you've got to understand Bible authority. And, and shepherds have got to take a, a rock-solid stand on Bible authority. And, and brother, I'll just tell you, I worry. I worry about some of the young men that are preaching today who think they've got to come up with a different way of saying things. And they're trying to find something new. It's one of the curses of, of being a young preacher sometimes. And I'm not saying that about all young preachers by any means. There are some fine gospel preachers today, young men in their 20s and 30s. But I also see some who want to find something that no one has ever found before. I, I was up in Indiana preaching uh, early last year, and I, I spent uh, half a day with two, two young men. I say young men, they're in their 40s. But I said, guys, Stand with the Word of God. Stay with the Word of God. Study the basic principles and expand on those things. Learn from them. Teach those things. And one of the men, a man about 42 years old, confessed. He said, you know, for the first few years of my preaching, I wanted to impress people with how much I knew. And I tried to find new things that no one had found before. Someone one time said this, the only thing new, the only thing original with preachers is their ignorance, and they need to overcome their ignorance by studying the Word of God. I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up. Study, study, study. Don't spend all your time, though, locked away. Talk with other preachers, men that you respect, men who uh, maybe have more experience than you. Uh, the, you know, we don't have as many problems with premillennialism today maybe as we had in the past. When I was on the radio for a number of years, premillennialism was something that came up almost every day on the radio broadcast. Premillennialism, Pentecostalism, and a lot that I've learned about those doctrines and Calvinism, things of that nature, I learned because people were peppering me with questions about those things. And it forced me to study on things that maybe I hadn't studied before. But you've got to study. The best way to combat error is to know the truth. Know the truth. And I appreciate older men who are committed to helping young men learn. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things you've heard of me among many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach other things. That's the best advice I can give with respect to that. By the way, if I cannot hear your question, Kyle is going to be the interpreter for me because I, uh, I'm hard of hearing. Can you hear me a little bit? 
I need to hand it to somebody else and have them read my question? I can hear you, but you sound <laughs> awfully bassy. <laughs> Your voice is deeper than mine, brother. <laughs> That's not me. What would you advise? What are your key takeaways for someone in a situation like mine where I've gone to start a new congregation in an area where historically churches have not had elders? And so the group I'm working with, a lot of the members have never had experience with elders before. And we need to work toward getting to where we can appoint elders. So aside from a situation where you already have elders and you're trying to develop leaders and, and men to be future elders to take over, what about a situation where you're starting from the ground floor and trying to get there? What, what are the key things that you would advise in that situation? Okay, starting from the ground floor, first of all, I'm thinking you're going to have to do the aggressive evangelism. And let me tell you what we do with respect to aggressive, aggressive evangelism at home. We have a little simple card. I think I may have a few copies of it. A little simple card that on one side, on one side, it just gives information about the church. Uh, Dallin Road Church, meeting place, phone number, website on the front side. Back side of the card, if you're ever looking for a church where your kids can really learn the Bible that teaches the truth about God's word, where joy and forgiveness in Christ are real, with solid Bible answers for troubled times, that is a real family of caring Christians, I recommend Dallin Road Church of Christ. And then there's a place to put, put your name. I, I write my first name and put my phone number. Not everybody's comfortable with that. Sometimes people just put their first name and hand out this card. We have literally, we have literally distributed over the past 10 or 12 years more than 10,000 of these cards in our community. It's how we get contacts. And we tell everybody, we, we put them in stacks of five on our table out in the foyer. We tell everybody, pick up a stack, and in the next four weeks, this month, you pass out these five cards. That's something everybody can do. It's not difficult. And only, only twice in all the years that I've done this, I've had people refuse to take the card. Only twice. Most of the time, people will say thank you. They'll tuck it in their shirt pocket. One will put it in her purse. And she may, not, she may not think about it at all after that. But they may find that card later when they're in crisis and remember, hey, someone invited me to a place where the Bible is really taught. And I need something like that in my life right now. They've got that little card. It's there. We've distributed them by the thousands and thousands. And we've gotten a lot of contacts. One time, a lady from... The, a checker at Walmart showed up on Sunday morning and said, I don't know anything about this church, but three times yesterday, people gave me this little card, <laughs> and I want to find out what this church is about. All the, whether you're looking at Barna, uh, whether you're looking at Unseminary, whether you're looking at Carrie Newhoff's material, these are ones that do surveys and show us what's most effective in reaching people. The most effective thing you can do in reaching people is personal invitation. Nothing will take the place of that. Personal invitation. You can have a great website. You can do citywide stuff and where you invite the entire town to come to a seminar on evolution, creations. Those are all good things. I don't speak against any of those things, but the most potent thing we have is personal invitations, inviting your friends, your family, your neighbors, inviting the checker at Walmart. I was in uh, Columbia, Tennessee a number of years ago, and they did a strange thing in the gospel meeting there. They said, on Sunday, we want you to preach to our people about how to do evangelism. Then on Monday, we want you to preach to the people that they bring to services. Okay, that'll work. And so they wanted me to spend the rest of the week preaching some first principle things. So Lee and I had to go to Walmart on Monday, 
And I've been telling these people, invite the checker at Walmart. And so here we are going through the line, and I thought, listen, if I'm preaching that to people, I gotta practice it. So I didn't have a card, but I said, at the Jackson Heights Church, I'm preaching there all this week. I want you to come and hear me preach tonight. And a black lady, she said, well, I just might do that. Where is the place? At what time do you start? So I gave her the details, and I'm standing at, I mean, I'm thinking she's coming. I'm standing at the door in the back, waiting for her to show up. And I stood there through the first and second song, the first prayer and the third song. And it was about time for me to get up and preach and no sign of the lady. So I was a little disappointed, but you know, a lot of the people you invite, they're not gonna come, you know that, but you invite everybody. You invite everybody, you don't, don't start excluding people. About halfway through my sermon, here she walks in the back door, she and another black lady and a young boy. And I wondered, all white church, three black people come in. How are they gonna treat them? Listen, when the service was over, they swarmed those three black folks and said, we're so glad that you're here. We want you to come back. Would you please do that? By the way, why were they so late? I gave them bad directions how to get to Jackson Heights. <laughs> but the lady who was the checker at Walmart, that didn't go anywhere. She wasn't interested in the further study. But the lady she brought with her, the Jackson Heights folks, they set up a study with her and converted her. And you know what? In some cases, that's the beginning. That's an open door into a community. You know, when I moved to Beaumont in 1978, the Pinecrest Church, as it was called at that time, it was an all-white congregation. We had a few Hispanics, but beyond that, all white. And I was up in the pulpit preaching on one occasion, and two black ladies walked in the back door. Actually, I, I wasn't preaching. I, we, I was introducing Brother Al Payne. We were having a gospel meeting, but I was, int I was introducing him. Those two ladies come in, looked around, didn't see any black folks, and they left. And as soon as I got done, I ran out the side door, ran around the building, and caught them. And I said, please come in, please. You're welcome here. And they said, no, we just can't. We just can't. And they didn't. But eventually, we had a breakthrough where we baptized a few black folks. And that was an open door. And we began to convert more and more and more. Today, a third of our congregation is African American in background. We have Asians, Hispanics, and African Americans. Of our eight elders, five of them were black men. But you've got to start, you've got to do the aggressive evangelism. You've got to keep inviting people. Whether people respond immediately or not, you, you put something in their hand that has the name of the church on it. That's how, we're, that's how we have grown over the years. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, brother, you also had, but you were asking about elders. You need to, yeah. teach, <laughs> you need to teach from the beginning. Listen, we're about Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Those, those teaching offices, pastors and uh, uh, evangelists and teachers, we are about equipping them for the future. And now that you're a Christian, we want to help you to learn how to teach others. And so you begin like that. And one of the great things you can do, it's David, right? David, one of the great things you can do is when you convert someone, tell them now you you can do what I've done. I've taught you. Now you start looking for other people that you can teach. And if you are not ready to teach them yet, I'll go with you and we'll do that together. One of our elders was baptized in 1986. His name is Wesley Pollard, senior. He's got a, a son, a junior. But Wesley Pollard, a black man, he's 72, 73 years old right now in very poor health. But from square one, when he obeyed the gospel, 
he wanted to teach others. And so the people he taught and baptized, he taught them to teach others right from square one, even though they didn't know a whole lot. He taught them, teach what you have learned. And he's baptized a large number of people. I couldn't even tell you how many he's baptized over the years. But you start off by training them to be teachers. You mentioned teaching some classes about leadership. Uh, it may be when we hear that, we think, okay, the qualifications for elders and deacons, what else do you talk about? What would be some things that you would recommend? Well, some churches have used my book, Kingdom Leaders, which, you know, to me is kind of old stuff right now because, uh, and I wish I could re redo the book, but whatever. There's nothing really in that book about how to deal with cultural change. Uh, I'm prepping a class for uh, September. We have a quarter change in September. And I'm going to teach about the nuts and bolts of being a shepherd. Uh, we have eight men currently, two who are in very poor health. Uh, and the size of our congregation, I think, demands that we train some more men. We've got some that we've been working with for the past two or three years, not quite ready yet, but we've got to do more to prep them for the future. Uh, teach them about the cultural change and how to address that, how to reach people in the community, how to truly be shepherds of the flock of God, what to do, practical things on how to, to shepherd. Uh, I'm putting some material together for that right now, and I'd be glad in a few months when I get it all together, I'd be glad to share it. Uh, but, you know, in the past, we appointed men to be elders, sometimes who we knew were wise men who could make good decisions. And that's just not the way it should be. We're not looking for foolish men who can't make good decisions. But we're look, we need to look for men who have a compassion for souls, men who love people. Uh, someone, uh, Brother uh, Don Truex, I was talking with a few weeks ago. Don said, you know, I was talking with some elders in the local church, and this one brother took me aside, one of the elders, and said, you know, I only have one problem as an elder. I just don't like people. I talked with another elder recently who said, I'm about trying to help people. We have people in our congregation who are in crisis. And he says, our eldership is about making decisions, not about helping people in crisis. I'll tell you, once you begin to think in terms of men who are truly pastors, men who are truly shepherds to the flock of God, You'll think about elders in a different way. We, we appointed a man a few years ago. His name is Lester Tarver, big black man, strong, could whip anyone in the congregation, but tender-hearted, loves people. A good teacher, but doesn't know anything about good grammar. Loves the word of God and loves people. And you think, could a man with poor grammar, can he serve as a shepherd? He's conducted himself remarkably well. When you begin, because he loved people and he had a sphere of influence within the congregation. He was already reaching out to people, he and his wife, and people were coming to him saying, what do I do with this problem? He was already a shepherd. He just hadn't been appointed yet. And that really, it changes your view when you begin to think about the men serving as pastors. I, I mentioned Ezekiel chapter 34. Let me just touch on that for a couple minutes, just very, very quickly. What these men were not doing in Ezekiel 34 is what shepherds are supposed to do today. And, and it, this is a powerful indictment. Woe to these shepherds of Israel, he says. Verse 3, you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. It was all about themselves, these kings and, and princes. The weak you have not strengthened.
We're about strengthening the weak. The sick you've not healed. We're about healing the sick. Not physically, you know that, but spiritually. You've not bound up the broken. You've not brought back what was driven away. You've not sought that which was lost with force and cruelty. You have ruled them. They were scattered. And the wolves devoured them. What these shepherds were not doing is what shepherds today must do. And when you see men who are already uh, evidencing these things in their lives, that's the kind of man you're looking for. That's the kind of man. Brother Max, uh, this is a bit self-serving. No, not a bit. It's completely self-serving. I serve as an elder. And I would love to hear what, what do you do or what does the group of elders you serve with do when you find someone that's comfortable with where they're at spiritually and you know they've stopped too soon? Yeah, well, those are the people oftentimes who don't attend all the services uh, because, hey, I know enough. I'm devoted enough. I have, I have enough of Jesus to get me through life. The apostle said in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and in the knowledge uh, of, of the Lord Jesus. In, 2 Peter, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Listen, he's not addressing necessarily babes in Christ. He's addressing Christians in general, that just like a baby is hungry for milk, we need to be hungry for the word of God. And we need to teach people, don't stop too soon. You need to grow. It's a lifelong process. I've been a Christian 54 years, I think, and I've been preaching 53 years. And I, I've learned things in the last 12 months that I didn't know last year. Growth is a lifelong process, and we need to tell people, not only tell people that, but help them to grow. We're in the business of growing people to be what Ephesians chapter 4 is about. Let, listen to the purpose of those teaching offices in Ephesians 4. He said that God gave these uh, pastors and teachers, why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen, if you're not doing the work of the ministry, it's because you're not equipped or you're not dedicated to doing it. But we've gotta be in the business of equipping them and growing them to where they can do the work of ministry in order that the body of Christ might grow. So we continue. To teach people and we don't give up on people we're patient that's one of the points that we tried to make we're patient with those that we're trying to train and some people are going to disappoint us terribly but we don't give up on our work because the work will last as long as we live and this unless the lord comes first max i've appreciated everything you've said and done up here really have been appreciative of your good work um, hearing you talk I see the qualifications of an elder in a different light than what I uh, have myself thought about it so hard to find men qualified that you find somebody that meets the qualification that doesn't necessarily mean they're able to do the work of an elder. And you mentioned yesterday in some of the decisions you made about accepting elders, you asked these questions about, well, you talked about what happens if you've got seven men that disagree with you, what are you gonna do? Um, Steve Wolfgang made the comment a few years ago that it's sort of like you got the qualifications, you're, you meet the qualifications, but can you do the job is another part of this thing. You want to you, talk about that a little bit? You meet the qualifications, but can you do the job? Yeah. Uh, I got started on, on this whole thing back in 19, I think 1986, 87, about the time that I became an elder. And I had a concern, even before that, that sometimes we were appointing men who met qualifications who were not really leaders. Those terms 
the, the term elder, presbyteros, uh, those were, you look back to the Old Testament, that the elder was the wise man who could help people see what was right. The elders at the gate of the city, you see that in the book of Ruth and in other places. Uh, these men were leaders. Uh, a shepherd, what does he do? The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside the still waters. He leads me to green pastures. A shepherd is a leader. The bishop oversees. He's watching. We, we saw Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock of God. Watch, he said. Watch. You're watching like, just like the shepherd watches over his flock. He's going to prevent the false teacher or the wolf from coming in. So I began this just by talking about that sometimes we appoint men who meet the family qualifications and he's apt to teach and we say we've got to make this man an elder. But he may not be a leader of men. He's not demonstrated the leadership qualities. Leadership is influence. And I think as someone said yesterday, if you think you're a leader and no one is following you where you're going, you're only taking a walk. You're not really a leader. You've got to have people who will follow you. Leadership is influence. We influence people to walk in God's way. Uh, Brother Max, I just have a, a question that I don't know if I can express it to the point that I, that I would like to get it answered. Uh, we talk about appointing elders. And I, I have in my lifetime witnessed different ways. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to Titus about, you know, how to, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, to appoint elders. Uh, so here's, a, here's a, in, in all the churches, he said. And so here you, you have a, 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 an evangelist, Titus, who is going to walk into a congregation obviously, and install elders. That looks to me like that's scriptural. I'm now, sorry, I didn't hear that last time. That, that looks to me like that's the scriptural way. Now, is that, here, here's my frustration. You've got a congregation, a small congregation, that over the years has just existed, and all of a sudden now we're going to appoint elders. And we have two or three men, what, and I'm just using a hypothetical case now, uh, that would meet the qualifications. Is it the congregation's responsibility to appoint those elders? Well, and and, and here's, here's my frustration. You've got these individuals, and they've exemplified themselves as being solid teachers, a lot of the teaching steps on people's toes, and so people have a tendency to ha have an ir irritation with, with some. And, uh, and so are, are they going to be, you know, when it comes down to a vote or whatever? And, and I think there are churches that do that. that I've, I've, I even know of a congregation that had elders and it reached a point where they thought they were better off without elders. So the elders stepped down, and now they have congregational meetings on a regular basis. Uh, and that, and that's, that's frightening to me. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a member of that congregation, but my daughter is. Well, you've raised about 10 questions, okay? <laughs> um, first of all, let me just make a very brief comment on Titus chapter 1. Titus is told to appoint elders in every city. I don't think Titus just walks in and says, you, you, and you. I think he appoints by means of teaching. That's why, the, that's why those things that follow Titus 1.5 uh, speak of the, the requirements for a man to be a shepherd. He's got to be a good family man. He's got to be a teaching man. He's got to be a man of capability. Uh, I, I know that there are some brethren who think, that a preacher can go in and just, you know, but he doesn't even know, he doesn't know the men. 
it seems to me that if you're going to, if the preacher is going to appoint them, if he is the one who makes the appointment, that he's got to at least know the men. But how do you have a congregation of people who are going to submit to the leadership of men in whom they have no confidence? You have to have the confidence of the government, okay? The confidence of those that are going to oversee. I think the congregation has to be involved in it. But I will say, in contrast, uh, I don't like the idea of, quote, the voting system. Because if you, if you take a vote and you say, well, majority rule, okay? And so 70% of the congregation says, yes, we want this man, 30% say no. You're setting up for division right from the beginning. You've got to have consensus. And uh, you know what happens sometimes, though, and this happens in men's business meetings all the time, brother. And it's, a, it's something that really upsets me. Here we have a men's business meeting where you've got 20 men from a church. They're meeting, discussing a thing. And uh, 19 of the men say, yeah, we think that's a good idea. I object. Okay? And so what happens is, Instead of having majority rule in that circumstance, we have minority rule because every man has to be pleased with the decision. And there are times when you're just going to have to say, look, this is something the church needs to do. We need to move forward on, on trying to appoint elders. And one man, how does one man get the, the veto over the whole church as to what the church might do? You know, I have... I've, in my old age, I reserve the right to be cranky, okay? <laughs> and I'll just tell men, if you find yourself constantly objecting to everything that the local church tries to do, something is probably wrong with you. Not always, but chances are something's wrong with you, that you're just the consummate objector to everything. We need to work together, brethren. We need to work together and, and try to be at peace with one another. The more we become like Jesus, conformed to the image of God's Son, the more we're going to be at peace with one another and the more we can come to consensus on things. I'm so sorry. Brother, yeah. Jim, have Jim? Question, and this will probably have to be our last question. Okay. Also, a question came up about resources. I asked him to mention one in particular. Yes, some resources uh, you can find on leadership. Uh, go to eciconference.com. I do a, a fall conference for many years where preachers get together and talk about uh, various issues. You'll find some uh, reference work there for a lot of other issues as well. But uh, particularly in 21, uh, 2021, uh, we uh, had Russ Legron and Martin, uh, Marty Broadwell, uh, Lonnie Oldag, and a couple of, well, three others who spoke on the subject of, of leadership and some of the very things you've been talking about uh, are there. It's eciconference.com. Uh, my question is this, and, and this last little of this uh, question and answer session has been uh, pretty somber and sober. Uh, and I think that this may take us in just a little bit different direction, uh, not quite as serious, but one of the cultural things that we are seeing is changes in dress. Now, I'm honest with you and say that. A uh, 50 year old me would not be caught dead coming to a place like uh, this morning uh, the way I'm dressed, as casually as I'm dressed. I'd be much more like some of these other men here come in a coat and tie. I always would. But things are changing even among preachers as they, as they teach. How does dress? And I notice, just happened to notice on one of your videos that you, did not, you didn't wear a coat. And I'm, I'm, I saw that. Ah, there at Dallin Road that you were preaching without a coat on and now you're wearing blue jeans <laughs> so uh, seriously though uh, how does uh, culture and dress uh, fit into the category uh, fit into this discussion of leadership because we're seeing a lot of casuality in dress uh, in our worship assemblies and everything of this nature how does that play uh, well in matters of dress, we're obviously looking at something which is a matter of judgment. I'm from Texas. I wear jeans, okay? And uh, on some of our 
Okay, you're, you're talking under your breath. You need to tell us all what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think you've done that 20 years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, dress is changing in our culture, and I don't always like it, but on any video where you see me teaching, I always try to look sharp, clean, uh, not always wearing a coat. And sometimes we do a thing sometimes on Sunday night we call tandem teaching, where we will take our pulpit off, take the podium off the, uh, off, the, off of the stage, and we'll set a couple chairs up there, and we'll talk back and forth about an issue. Sometimes we're wearing a coat with no tie, or sometimes we might wear a tie with no coat. A little more casual. There's a, a, a problem in our time, and I remember Caleb Churchill saying this. Caleb preaches up in New York. Caleb said, I was dressed with a coat and tie, and a man walked into our little group, our little assembly, and looked around and says, I don't belong here. A man dressed in shabby clothes. And in James chapter 2, you've got to make accommodation. The man comes in dressed in shabby clothes. He needs to feel comfortable. I don't believe, though, in just being sloppy and shabby as far as a leader. I think a leader tries to set an example. But on Sunday night in our congregation, we may have two men who wear a tie. Uh, out of the large number of people we have, maybe two men who wear a tie, and maybe only one who will be wearing a coat on Sunday night. Dress is changing. What I don't like is disrespected. Uh, dress that disrespects what we're doing, disrespects the audience, disrespects the Lord. That's the best answer I can give, but it's part of our cultural change. And so we, we don't want to all wear tuxedos and, and a black tie that says, hey, I don't belong here. But on the other hand, we don't want to be sloppy and shabby. That's the best answer I can give, Jim. Thank you, Brother Max. We appreciate so much the good lesson that you did. Thank you to all who've been present here for the good discussion and the good spirit. A couple of things that we'll mention. Uh, we're talking some about resources. I want to let you know in addition to Brother Max's book that we mentioned, uh, recently Brother Keith Hamilton that actually was here Monday night uh, did a book called Developing Principled Leaders. There are some of those in the foyer and I would commend that to you as well. Lance asked me also to mention that there is also a box at the store in which you can put your name in for a drawing for a pretty significant gift card. So if you haven't already done that, in the interim this afternoon, uh, take some time and go uh, do that. We're going to ask Brother Kevin Maxey to dismiss us in prayer. Please return back tonight. It will be our last session, 7 o'clock. We'll end our time together, and we hope you have a good day. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed us to be in your family. We do not deserve this blessing but we have reaped uh, the blessings of faithful leaders before us who have believed in us and equipped us and pointed us to you. And we pray, Lord, as we return to our homes that we would be committed to growing your family, to encouraging one another to be united, and to reaching out to the world so that we can invite others into this blessed family that you have uh, given us this opportunity to share in. We thank you for uh, the challenges and the encouragement we've received today, and we give you all glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.